Good morning. Good morning. It's March 5th. It's Tuesday. It's Super Tuesday. And it is day nine of the Rust trial. The prosecution closed their case at the end of court on day eight yesterday, Monday, March 4th. Today, we're going to be getting into the defense's case. And I imagine most of the defense's case, because these attorneys said they're going to give the case to the jury on Thursday. So I imagine we've got about two days of witnesses with the defense case. Um, one of them should be Thel Reed. And I would imagine that that's the witness the defense will end with. Of course, the prosecution will have a chance to then do rebuttal. So just for a quick, where are we in trial? The state has rested. They've presented their evidence. There were motions this morning. Those were not streamed anywhere. They were not recorded. I'm going to keep checking the court website to see if we have a ruling on the motion to dismiss it, whether or not the tampering with evidence count got dismissed or not. I'm not optimistic with this judge. I just don't think there's enough evidence. I think it could have been. Um, but I'm not optimistic that this judge would do that or say, just let it go to the jury. So we'll see. The involuntary manslaughter, of course, is not going to get dismissed on that motion. Now we get into the defense case. That means the defense is going to um, be asking the direct questions. The prosecution is going to get to ask the leading questions. Of course they are. We're going to get the prosecutor, I think, objecting more than the defense did now that we're in the defense case. And then we are going to get into um, the prosecution's rebuttal and closing arguments, and this will go to the jury. So with all of that, we're going to uh, resume court. I like to be able to go at 1.25 speed. No spoilers if anyone is watching ahead anywhere. I appreciate you. Um, I got home, but my luggage didn't, so my hairdryer at all is not with me today. So uh, hi, everybody. <laughs> traveling's an adventure. Um, I've got some Starbucks. I've got a whole lot of water and, uh, it's election day. It's, it's everything. Let's just roll the intro and go to court. Shall we? Jury duty. Day nine, day nine. Hey there. I'm Emily D Baker, the internet's go-to legal analyst, breaking down the legal side of the pop culture and entertainment stories. We can't stop talking about. I'm a big fan of the cursey words. I've been a licensed attorney for over 17 years, but this is not legal advice. This is where the law nerds unite to talk about facts, not <laughs> Let's get into it. We're going to roll right to court. Um, I actually really like the defendant's outfit today. I mean, female defendants definitely have more, um, right. Can you be seated? Have, defense? have more of a, of a change in their attire than most male defendants, especially like a Daryl Brooks who's just in a jail jumpsuit every day. So, you know, it's it's always nice when we get to see the fashion choices in court. Uh, I like this outfit quite a lot. Your Honor, the defense calls Lorenzo Montoya. The defense calls Lorenzo Montoya. We have audio in both channels today. So um, big fan of audio in both channels. Big, 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 big fan. Yes, we're at 1.25 speed. Um, just keep an eye on this courtroom and how empty it is, because when we cover the Baldwin case, it's going to be a whole different situation. So. Good morning, Mr. Montoya. Can you please explain to the jury how you are employed? Good morning. My name is Lorenzo Montoya, and I am a compliance officer with New Mexico OSHA. And what do you do as a... They're calling the OSHA officer. I chat all the Princess Bride references. All the Princess Bride references are allowed. Um, Mr. Montoya, your name has been made famous by a movie that we love. Um, we hope that no one has killed your father, but if they do, then they um, they need to prepare to die. But they're allowed to call the OSHA officer. Now, the OSHA report was fucking scathing. But some of this, I don't know if they're going to be able to get into. I want them to get it. I want them to mention it all. I don't know if all of it's proper evidence, but, um, sir, I think there's one set. Sir, was this, was this set a cluster? Explain to us. But OSHA's in the house. Let's go. Compliance officer. I'm a safety inspector. I'm a safety inspector, accident investigator, um, in summary. <laughs> and what do you need to do to become a safety inspector accident? What is your background training and experience? Is that the question? Um, 
well, you'll require some experience in the field of safety, um, workplace safety, industrial safety, chemical safety. Um, accident investigation requires some training, and that can be accomplished on the job. Uh, and is what does OSHA stand for? Occupational Safety and Health Administration. And what is, is that a state agency? New Mexico OSHA is a state plan, whereas federal OSHA is um, uh, at the federal level nationwide. Is the Bureau a part of the New Mexico Environment Department? Yes. So tell, tell us about your experience then in um, workplace safety. Sure. Uh, my experience um, with occupational safety began in the U.S. Air Force. Um, I can turn it up a bit. Uh, I was in charge of our hazardous materials program. Um, and uh, following that, I worked for the New Mexico Department of Health at the Behavioral Health Institute, um, performing more sort of safety and walkthroughs for our patient health in that scenario. And how long have you been a, a safety inspector with OSHA? Been with OSHA for five years. How did you get involved in, in the incident we're here for today in this case? Uh, OSHA, one of its duties is to inspect workplace accidents, incidents, or um, anything that results in a fatality. Uh, in this scenario, we were notified of a workplace fatality, and so I was assigned the inspection. Because workplace and, fatality. And you're assigned an inspection that's reported to you. What What is the purpose of your investigation? It's a fact-finding investigation. Um, our goal is to try to identify what may have caused the incident um, so we can either recommend or require corrective measures to prevent such a thing from happening again. And did you do an investigation um, of the of the workplace safety incident that occurred on the set of rust on October twenty first to twenty twenty one? Correct. Yes. What what does that mean? What is what does your investigation entail? So the investigation is to, um, if possible, find a root cause for whatever may have led up to the incident. Um, Sometimes things are not so simple and they have a lot of complicated factors. That is it because somebody occur. loaded live um, ammo into in this a scenario, weapon? The investigation is to cause... try to identify what led to the accident occurring despite whatever measures may have been put in place. Was it live ammo being process. in a weapon? And, and how do you do that? What did you do in this investigation? Um, the same as any. Uh, when we conduct investigations, we interview witnesses. Uh, we interview members of management. Uh, we might engage with um, industry professionals if necessary. Um, visit the site, take photos. I'm very interested to see what he has to case? say. Yes. Because when, when was it that you vis visited the site? This uh, we originally set visited, was a mess. I believe the following day, October 22nd, was when we were notified. Did you communicate with the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Department as well? Um, only in the beginning when we were trying to uh, ensure that we would be able to access the site without potentially stepping into um, a crime community. scene. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, which witnesses do you remember interviewing in this case? That day, the only individual present on site was uh, Catherine Roe Walters. Okay. That and day. In, in the course of your investigation, how many witnesses did you interview in this case? I could only estimate the top of my head. Um, I believe we interviewed 17 people. Okay. Did you interview Ms. Gutierrez? We did, yes. Did you interview Mr. Hall? Yes. Did you interview Mr. Baldwin? Yes. Did you interview uh, Sarah Zachary? Yes. Gabrielle Pickle? Yes. So, no, wait, not Gabrielle Pickle. Sorry. Did anything from this interview with Mr. Hall end up in his cross examination? No. That was weird. Did anything from any interview with, I don't know, Seth Kinney, the owner of the Prop House, end up in his cross examination? No, it didn't. It's so weird. There's so much stuff that could have been brought up that never got brought up. Did you Ever. review any documents in this case that aided Where's in your my investigation? Goat? Yes, we reviewed many documents. Does your, is your investigation, how is it that you gather documents that you review? Uh, generally, we request any safety policies, programs, or trainings from the employer. Russ Productions. Did you and determine who was the employer? specific documents did you review in this case? In this case, we had requested any safety policies that they may have, and they provided us with, uh, they refer to as safety bulletins. Um, and they have a longer title, which I can't recall the name of. Um, they're organized by a committee of some kind. But um, safety bulletin number one is um, the applicable safety bulletin for firearm safety. Okay. And what other documents do you review? Uh, they gave us a host of other of the safety bulletins, which cover um, various miscellaneous you encounter on a set from lighting to electricity and so forth. 
What about communications between the various witnesses and cast and crew on set? Did you review any of those things? Uh, we did receive some of those documents, uh, but those from did who? not come from our employer. They came from our uh, individuals that we interviewed. So, so the individuals you interviewed, the witnesses, provided you with emails and texts? Some, yes. And were you able to come to any findings and conclusions in this case? Uh, we did come to a conclusion. And were those findings... Um, this is not what I was expecting. Did you put those findings in a written report? Based on the court's ruling. Once you do that written report, what's what's the process there? But no one's objecting. So I guess everybody's uh, on the same the page report, but me. Um, proofread it. And um, <laughs> when it's completed, we uh, assemble the case file together. And if necessary, we issue a citation. And in this scenario, we did issue a citation. Was it the Where largest citation? citation to in this case? A Rust, uh, excuse me, Rust Movie Productions LLC. Was it the largest citation in the issue, history of what, the world? What was the citation that you issued for? The, Why did you issue a citation? Ma'am, let him finish. The citation was issued because, in our conclusions, uh, we determined that the management team was responsible <laughs> for a series of failures that, uh, in our opinion, accumulated in an accident. Because that's okay, what you do. Okay, management team, um, who do you mean specifically? Uh, that's what OSHA does. OSHA determines if the employer, the workplace, is at fault. That's literally their job. Specifically... Okay. We mean the chain of command um, above the employees, this, um, beginning um, at the lowest level with Sarah Zachary and then Gabrielle Pickle and then um, Dave Halls. So did your findings um, then include any... So, so then your findings that you just spoke of, those didn't include Ms. Gutierrez, right? She was not uh, as a boss. an employee directly engaged in the work. She is mentioned in the report frequently. But she's not uh, an but employer. But in terms of who do we identify as a member of management and thus who do we consider responsible? Um, she's not. She's just an employee. Because she's not okay. management. Um, and and once you, you do your report and issue the citation, does the employer, the production company, get an opportunity to contest that? They do. And did they contest that in this case? They did. Was a fine ever ultimately levied against the employer in this case? Uh, there was, yes. What was that fine? Lots. Um, they they came to a settlement agreement with the department um, at oh. $100,000 even. Oh, they settled. In your experience, have you seen your uh, have you seen the state of New Mexico levy such a high fine like that? They didn't levy. For work space, they work settled. Safety, ever? I believe we have in the past. Um, is is that an average? Is that a usual fine amount that you see? For typical inspections, no. Is it higher or lower? Uh, this would be higher than normal. And your report that and you they write, settled uh, once you're completed. It are there any other individuals who review and audit your work? There are. Who explain to the jury the levels of review and audit of your findings and conclusions? Explain to me how management being dog shit changes whether or not your client loaded the weapon because I'm just not seeing it yet. Just, I think, chat, let me know. There's like, I don't know, 14,000 of you in here. Let me know. Because management failures don't excuse her failures. And I don't think we've gotten to the point that like management made it impossible to do her job because literally she had one job. Y'all are like, you're waiting. We're waiting for you to explain. I'm like, I can't explain. <laughs> I don't. It. It stinks from the head, but that doesn't excuse her responsibility, right? In your report. Right. So the proofreading, final edits, and that sort of thing um, fall to first initially my supervisor, and then um, her supervisor, who is our program manager. And then from him, it would pass up to our bureau chief, Bob Genoway, and as well as our legal team. He's like, we have um, a large chain of command. And potentially our, our um, department director, all the way up to the secretary. Sounds like the DA's office. Um, Potentially something that is a uh, how many bosses do you have? Public interest. All and in fact, did, in this case, did the secretary for the environment department review and audit your report and your findings? He reviewed the report. I reviewed uh, by it. By the time it got to him, there was there was nothing left than just to review it. I mean, okay. for content, uh, not for chain of custody. Does your, I reviewed it. Your report and your citations are those a matter of public record? They are. Is your report kept in the New Mexico OSHA environment department? This is not um, yes. going to be evidence. Did you bring a copy? I saw you walk up to the stand today with a folder. Did you bring a copy of your report today? I have a copy of this is our an evidence. investigative summary. Sometimes we refer to that as a narrative. Not evidence. Okay. And is that the document that you prepared that we've been discussing this morning? That's 11 pages? 
It is 11 pages, yes, so possibly. Okay, and it's this document that you make your findings and conclusions, right? Yes, we list them out. Your Honor, I'm going to hand the witness what I've marked as Defendant's Exhibit GG. May I approach? Your Honor, may we, may we approach? Yes. For everybody who's like, my voice sounds better, yes, I have I have uh, landed back in the land of, uh, of humidity. And uh, my voice is doing better. I also didn't talk a ton yesterday, if I could. I also slept a bit. Uh, I got to sleep in a bit. I'm still waiting for my suitcase to arrive. But, you know, my voice sounds better. My hair looks worse. It's it's six of one, half dozen of the other. The OSHA report is not evidence. You can't put the OSHA report in evidence. If she's trying to show him findings from the OSHA report, that's not evidence. They had a um, a whole hearing about whether or not this would come in. And they said our expert relied on the OSHA report. Silly, silly me thinking that they had an expert in like safety on sets, not the OSHA expert. OSHA really looks at workplace safety overall and whether management has failed to keep their workers safe. A whole different thing than um, having someone who specializes in the movie industry looking at the OSHA report and being able to say, None of this should happen on a movie set. I thought they were using the OSHA report through an expert in film and movie. That's not what it is. They're using this expert from, they're using the guy who did the thing from OSHA, which is surprising to me. I mean, I've seen so many of you that are in this industry in the chat and in my DMs, you know, when Instagram's not down, talking about how horrified you are by this set. I don't think it would be super hard for them to find someone who would um, who would look at the OSHA report and be like, this set's a mess? Uh, Mia Moo, Emily, do you know where your luggage is? I do. When is it getting back to you today? I had a very close connection um, in Atlanta, and I outran my luggage. And I talked to the lovely gate agent when I left Phoenix and said, I have a very tight connection in Atlanta. Will my luggage be okay? And she's like, yeah, it's going to be fine. There were like four people who also went from Phoenix to Nashville that were in line with me because none of our luggage made it because the turnaround was too tight in Atlanta. But it will it should be delivered here shortly, actually. So and if you need to refresh your memory from looking at your report, I wanted to go through. So you, did your report include factual findings from your investigation? Yes, it does. Did it also include conclusions that you reached from that investigation? Yes. And did you conclude... Uh, whether with respect to Hannah Gutierrez, whether she was or was, I guess, did you conclude that Hannah was not provided with enough time to inventory and inspect the dummy blink rounds? That's leading. Objection. Uh-huh. Approach. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Um, I like seeing the other DA or the other, I don't know if he's a special prosecutor or a member of the DA's office. Um, we're going to do this a lot today. This is why I like being a little on delay from live court. So like I stated, Mr. Montoya, in your report, did you conclude whether... Fun fact, my flight from Vegas to Phoenix ended up being a car ride. Um, that's a story for later and not a flight. Hannah was provided with enough time to inventory and inspect dummy rounds and, dummy, and blinks. That was one of our conclusions, yes. What specifically did you conclude about that? May I look at the full report? <laughs> like, would refresh your recollection you. to review your report? Yes, it would. Okay. Um, do you have it in front of you or do you want me to hand you a copy? I do have a copy in front of me unless yours is uh, highlighted or uh, Page seven. Would you like to review page seven? Um, Willow's Angel, I will take a poll about this a little later on today about whether we think Hannah will testify. I don't think she should. I don't think she'll testify well. Um, okay. I think. So, I what, think what she were your opens conclusions big... with respect to whether Ms. Gutierrez was provided enough time to inventory and inspect the dummy rounds from her employer? We came to the conclusion that she was not afforded time to conduct her duties to the best of her diligence. And who didn't give her enough time to do that? She had been uh, instructed by Gabrielle Pickle to focus on other tasks. And. And did Rust, did, your, did you determine whether Rust had any process to ensure that live rounds were not brought onto set? Uh, we determined that Rust did not have any specific processes or procedures to prevent that possibility. I mean, they worked with and the prop house. why was it that that was not, that, that was on the employer in your opinion versus the armor? Because we do workplace stuff. In that manner, the employer is 
asking an individual to perform multiple safety related functions for them while also telling them that they're spending too much time engaging in those safety related functions and need to devote more time to other duties. And on that matter, we determined that to be maybe a managerial decision. Okay. Um, and did you conclude um, whether rest management provided the armor, Ms. Gutierrez, with any um, authority on training? Uh, we concluded that um, she effectively had no authority to make any sort of training decisions. And in your investigation, was that failure to give the armor authority to determine uh, training, was that a violation of any rust safety procedures? It was. What was that a violation of? Safety I bulletin number one. Will testify. Um, He's on their list. One of the required list. items is that the armor determines when training is necessary Correct. and if retraining is necessary based on somebody maybe mishandling a firearm. Okay. And and what evidence, did you see any evidence in your investigation about um, the armor, Ms. Gutierrez, uh, attempting to attain additional training um, on firearms for the actors? Not specifically attempting to retrain, uh, to acquire more time for training into my memory. Okay. And uh, he's being more that, specific than you are, man. The, did the employer, I guess, did Ms. Gutierrez read, raise any concerns about not being provided adequate time to perform her armor duties? Yes. And what in your investigation was Rust's response to that? Um, our conclusion was concerns about not being provided adequate time to perform her armor duties. Yes. That was the stream, not me. And what in your investigation Often was Rust's me. response to this that? This was them. <laughs> um, our conclusion was that those um, statements regarding not having enough time went unheeded and uncommented on. By whom? Uh, Gabrielle Pickle and uh, possibly- um, But that's like Sarah hearsay Zachary on hearsay. Did you talk to Gabrielle Pickle? No. Sarah Zachary and Dave Halls? Yes. So whatever Gar Gabrielle Pickle said is multiple layers of hearsay Did you make any conclusions in your findings in your report about- um... How is no one objecting to the things Gabrielle Pickle supposedly said to somebody who supposedly said it to him? I mean, not that I think that Rust Productions did things safely, but how how are we not objecting? How? What about who the Rust safety official okay. was on set? We did. Who was that? Dave Halls. And did you find any fault with anything that Dave Halls did? I do. So OSHA considers You're not the entire me, I do. management apparatus to be a single entity. Um, and in this scenario, there are these three individuals who are part of this upper level of management. And Dave Hall's responsibility is a safety coordinator on set. We certainly found that there were a number of um, safety bulletin number one policies that were not followed or adhered to that would fall within his purview. Okay. Uh -huh. and, and were any of those pertaining to having the actors point guns at, at crew members? That is one of the items in the safety bulletin. And are you saying that Mr. Halls and the Rust top level management were in violation of that? Uh, Rust's management team did not take measures that were required in safety bulletin number one to, to permit the aiming of a firearm in, at a camera or whatever the case might be. Okay. What did they need to do to permit and aiming at a camera? I you talked a feel little like bit that's about maybe a no Rust all the way around. not providing Ms. Gutierrez with sufficient time to thoroughly inventory ammunition. And by ammunition, I mean blanks and dummies. Um, were there any findings with respect to Rust providing their staff uh, sufficient time to inspect this ammunition to ensure there were no live rounds present? No, our conclusion was they weren't afforded time. I'm sorry. And with with respect to whether or not rust production showed uh, an indifference to hazards associated with firearms, what was uh, your opinion on that? The sorry, conclusion that was of the bureau uh, on that was based on the. Was it your number conclusion? of requirements listed in safety bulletin number one that were either um, ignored or otherwise not at all followed or totally contrary. The OSHA report was to, scathing. Um, we found scathing. that Rust was uh, 
willful. Uh, they were plain indifferent to the recognized hazards of firearms. And when you're you're doing this, does OSHA have a requirement to look at fault of specific employees? She's going to ask right now, it seems. As part of our inspection process, we try to identify a root cause if we can. Um, whether an accident is caused because someone is falling asleep at the wheel or whatever the case might be, we do try to identify those things. Uh, in this scenario, we weren't necessarily able to identify any um, particular standout reason why an employee would be to blame. So really what was in, in total bottom line here, the root. What's your understanding of what that employee's job was, sir? I have some questions about it. Um, Sarah asked, did Emily cover the OSHA report in another video? Yes, I did. I covered it in an episode of the Emily show podcast. Um, it's on the playlist. It's an episode where I covered the FBI and OSHA in this case. Um, cause that you found. I'm very interested in what he has to say. To summarize the, um, entire report would be that, um, Rust Movie Productions, um, identified a, a hazard, a workplace hazard, working with firearms, and they adopted a firearm safety policies, but they totally failed to enforce them, train their employees on them, practice them. Hannah is an employee. Reference them, no, nothing. They, they adopted it and it stopped at the word adoption. Nothing further happened. Okay. And was it brought to their attention by Ms. Gutierrez and others that there were these deficiencies? Safety concerns were raised regarding uh, the policies listed in safety bulletin number one not being followed. And what was Rust's response to those concerns that were raised by Ms. Gutierrez? Uh, I, again, they seem to have chosen to simply not respond. Uh, Dave Halls was supposed to be enforcing the workplace safety rules. He was the safety officer. I don't know if this testimony will negate the professional armorer testimony talking about exactly what the armorer's job was. He's looking at the armorer as an employee, saying employee was not given adequate support to do their job. The armorer expert said armorer's job is to stop, stop everything if it's unsafe. He's saying, you know, armorer raised safety concerns, other people raised safety concerns. Um, and production ignored them, which we do know. I just don't know if it's going to counteract um, what the prosecution has shown. But the defense's strongest argument, I think, is not she's just a girl. I think the defense's strongest argument is Hannah was not negligent in her job because everyone else was so reckless she couldn't even do her job. But that's a very nuanced conversation to have on the law and the elements of the law when somebody has died. And that might be too nuanced for a jury unless they feel very bad for her, which might be why the prosecution wanted them to keep hearing the word cocaine over and over because it might change the empathy that this jury has for this defendant. Let's get to cross-examination. Thank you. Sir, you don't know what an armorer does, do you? You're not familiar with movie sets? Like workplace safety is normally like restaurants and like stuff like costco and stuff like that like how many movie sets have you investigated sorry i'm doing my own cross-examination i would like to hear all those questions Honor. mr montoya good morning good morning i'd like to i'd like to talk to you a little bit uh, uh before i i get into any of the details a little bit more about the inspection process that you typically conduct um how long do you have to perform this inspection uh osha has a limit of six months to the day um to initiate and conclude an inspection. I all like right. this prosecutor. So does Better. that mean that in some instances you may not have all of the uh, evidence that is available from, for example, an investigating uh, law enforcement agency? Uh, correct. And in this case, uh, is it true that you did not have the sheriff's report at the time that you issued your, your report? Yes, the sheriff's report was the following day or two, I believe. All right. So just to be clear, none of the information that the that was included in the sheriff's investigative report made its way into your report and findings, correct? Correct. Only their initial uh, public release, um, press release. 
the press it, release only that okay but not any of the actual investigative materials no all right um this might help hannah for the ways that we just talked is, about like oh, production it bad be authorized under law to fine or penalize individual employees no only employers correct yes correct. and as a result of that i believe you explained that your your primary role of investigation is to look at what the employer did in terms of creating a, a potentially hazardous situation uh what they could do to prevent it or what they did to create it yes great thank you um so even if as part of your investigation I uh you found concerning Chat, conduct I need my notebook. by an Hold individual on. employee you couldn't issue that person a fine correct not individually no great um and 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 this is not a criminal investigation that you're conducting correct correct all right and so uh, you mentioned you did not review the Santa Fe Sheriff's Office report. Um, did you conduct a forensic download of any of the individual's phones involved in this incident? No. Um, did you review the over 100 beside, behind the scenes videos that were produced by production outfitters? No, those were not available to us. We're All back right. to cross-examination with a lot of that's not my job testimony. Movie? Only a small clip that was put into public media it, and is, was that the clip, just kind of a few second clip of Mr. Baldwin manipulating the firearm, firearm out of his bandolier? Correct. So all of the other videos that were filmed as part of the movie, you did not look at any of those, correct? Correct. All right. Um, did you hire any sort of firearms expert to review the revolver or ammunition? We did not. All right. Uh, did you hire or consult with a, uh, a an expert in armor, like film armoring? Uh, no, we did not. All right. Um, did you review any of the fingerprint analysis from the FBI? Twifty, I agree with this. Uh, there no. need to be more standards for armors on set. Absolutely agree. From the FBI? No. Hopefully this will change. Uh, did you review any of the ballistic chemistry analysis from the FBI? No. Are you aware that Ms. Gutierrez worked in her role as an armorer for 10 of the 12 filming days? As far as we're aware, it was uh, only permitted eight okay. days as an armorer. Based so on what information? you would be surprised to hear that she actually was afforded 10 armorer days out of the 12 filming days. Uh, it would be news? Yes. Okay. Great. Um, are you aware that Ms. Pickle testified at trial that if Ms. Gutierrez had asked for more than those 10 days, she may have granted them if they were justified? I'm not aware that she testified that. All right. Um, are you aware that on the morning of October 21st, 2021, Ms. Gutierrez had approximately three hours of time in which she could have inspected ammunition or done a, a safety check of the, of the revolver involved in this incident? No. Um, are you aware that, that it's been testified here in the court that Ms. Zachary was Ms. Gutierrez's supervisor when she was performing props, but that the roles were actually reversed, that, Hannah, that Ms. Gutierrez provided instruction to Ms. Zachary with regard to the armorer duties? Um, yes. With I, I needed more of there. this prosecutor, this peers. trial. Great. Um, and do you agree that Ms. Gutierrez and her Even role as armor he's, contributed? He's kind of slow. He's better at 1.25, but I needed more of that him. You identified in your report? This is so clear. Um, it's just all so sorry, clear. Could you repeat the question? Sure. Do you agree that Ms. Gutierrez and her role as armor contributed to some of the findings that you issued in your report? No, I'm not sure I could necessarily agree. Okay. Yeah, I like his style of questioning a lot. It's very clear and easy to follow. And he's pointing out, these are all the things you didn't do because this was not a criminal investigation. You investigate employers, right? You didn't know that she was in charge. You didn't have the police report. You didn't have all the did, investigative did reports. Turn to page four of your report? That's not your job. And that's okay. That's not, we, they're different things, but that doesn't excuse her behavior. And that's, I think, what they're getting at here. Uh, on paragraph 13, okay. the last sentence unless a round is removed from a storage bar, box or firearm and inspected, it cannot be verified as a dummy round. Uh, is Do you believe that that is the function of an armor to perform this inspection that you indicated on this report? Oh, great question. I believe that would be one of their many functions, yes. Right. So if she, uh, if she failed to do that, then would she have contributed in this regard? 
OSHA's opinion <laughs> is that management has to enable the work to be done in the first place. So if she didn't do that, our question would be, why wasn't someone ensuring that she would do that? Uh, and thus we would turn back to management. Why okay. wasn't management? Sure. And that gets back to the whole fact that you're looking at the employer primarily as the as the basis of your investigation, correct? Correct. All right. Um, do you do you agree that if Ms. Gutierrez loaded live ammunition into a firearm and then passed it off as a cold gun, that would be a workplace hazard? Certainly. All right. Um, and Good then cross. lastly, are you aware, uh, I, I believe you conducted an interview with Ms. Gutierrez, correct? Correct. And in that interview, she indicated to you that she asked two producers for additional training time, correct? You recall that? I don't recall that off the top of my head. Okay. All right. Nothing further. Wait, what are you doing? Show him the report. Mm -hmm. Refresh his recollection. Sir, why are we just... Why are we all just letting the impeachment stuff go? They ask the question, they're like, ah, no. And then nobody brings the receipts. Bring the receipts. A little hypothetical that- It's the most fun, guys. So if- um, Have some fun. Gittes had passed off a loaded gun as cold, would that be a workplace hazard? Um, what if uh, Rust had not allowed the armor sufficient time to inspect that gun um, and rushed her and instructed her specifically of what they they wanted her to do it's her job whose fault would it be then uh, objection calls for legal conclusion truly um so they're approaching based on this uh calling for a legal conclusion i think <sighs> two things can be true in that in what he, mr lewis had stated if uh, there was a gun passed off as cold Whose fault would it be, or whose, I guess, whose responsibility would it be to ensure that the armor had sufficient time and resources to make that gun safe? It's always the responsibility of management to supervise effectively and quality control effectively. Um, if an employee is conducting a um, safety related task, they pass it off as safe and supervision does nothing with that and they allow it to be implemented supervision's responsibility to double check that and it was it also rust's um, responsibility to ensure that the employee had um to to take those i guess did your investigation reveal that miss gutierrez um had specifically requested more time to do those safety checks she had expressed on more than one occasion that she did not have sufficient time. Based on what she told and, you, who else told you? Uh, Rust's response, was there any fault in Rust's response to, to Ms. Gutierrez's concerns and requests? In one scenario, uh, Gabrielle Pickle responded that, um, um, Is this based on an email? There are no Is this more, hearsay? Um, armor days out of the eight. Is left. this hearsay on hearsay? She had responded um, that then no more training days are to occur. Um, so their response has been to just, okay, we'll cut it then. Cut off the firearm training days. Right. And um, it, did you actually receive a copy of the Santa Fe Sheriff's report after this um, report of yours came out? Uh, our office received a copy of the report, yes. And had you guys previously requested that many times from them? We had previously requested um, it wasn't, whatever documents they'd be willing to share. Or it wasn't understand. done yet. So. And is it necessary to review fingerprints to determine whether rust management um, demonstrated an indifference to, outside the to scope hazards across. and violation of their own standards? That's, do you have to look at fingerprints to do that? Outside no, the not at all. scope of Do you have across. to look at DNA to do that? No. Uh, or, That's also outside. Or any firearms expert? Not to determine their... Um, safety conduct. I think stuff. understanding no. the job of the armor might be helpful though. And were there any other communications um, that you reviewed uh, regard between Ms. Gutierrez no, and he's Gabriel No, he's not an expert. This is uh, all hearsay. Nobody's objecting. Demonstrated all or, the pickle stuff's coming um, in through like emails. Your findings that Rust was at fault in this. And Rules not don't Ms. exist. Individually. I'll rephrase the question, Your Honor. <laughs> we're going to strike that question. Go ahead. Oh, we um, struck something there... from the record. It's day nine. 
you said that you can't, you can, um, is it true that you can actually find fault with specific individuals conduct? May I ask you to clarify? Yeah, it, it, you can, can you find fault with, when you're investigation, you're looking at specific individuals and can you say that in, individual was wrong for doing this? Objection. Well, she looks confused. She's like, why are we objecting? I'm confused as to why we aren't objecting more. <laughs> why aren't we objecting right more? All right. I think you're right. I think you already answered that question. <laughs> um, were there any other communications that you observed between Gabrielle Pickle and Miss Gutierrez um, that oh, was say. evidence of Rust not providing Miss Gutierrez with the necessary resources that she stacks needed. Stacks and stacks of hearsay. Um, off the top of my head, uh, there was a text conversation and then a separate email. Okay. He hasn't talked about what it was without <laughs> stating what the text conversation. The objection was again for hearsay. Um, she, the defense attorney on her redirect said, he hasn't said what it's going to say in the court, quietly said, he's going to. And you can hear it coming. You can hear the, this is what everybody said is coming. You, the, the, the amount of improper hearsay that is coming in through a non-expert witness right now is absolutely bananas. And my head already hurts this morning. Is Can you please continue your answer? Yes, and they check sure. our email conversation. Okay, so you reviewed actual texts and emails between Gabrielle Pickle and Ms. Gutierrez. We reviewed screenshots of their texts and emails, yes. Okay, and and the subs the relevance of of without saying what's in it, the relevance of that informed which findings in your report? Yes. Which ones? Um, confusing sorry, questions get yeah, you confusing answers. Yeah, the conversations answers. you reviewed between Gabrielle Pickle and Ms. Gutierrez. Mm -hmm. um, what? What did those pertain to in terms of your findings? Which findings? I think you're still calling for hearsay. Uh, yes. So I would have to review the text versus the email conversations to remember which one is which. That's fair. Um, one is regarding the um, notification regarding that they have used all eight of their armor days and the no further training then, because that would require more days. Um, and then a different, the other conversation. Um, I believe was regarding um, firearms being left unattended or something of that nature. Okay. Um, and what was your finding? And if you need to refresh your memory by looking at your report, that's fine. But what is what was your finding with regard to firearms being left unattended? We're going to do a lot of this today. A lot, a lot of this today. The judge's face is like, no, no, no. So you can answer the question, Mr. Montoya. If you remember it, it I wouldn't. It was the finding in your report pertaining to firearms being left unattended. Sure. Um, may I refresh my memory? Yes, please. Generally, there's a few more questions to that, but that's okay. Um. I don't think we're at code red. I don't think we're at fuckery. The attorneys have been doing this the entire time. The we have been getting very few objections on both sides. Um, there's a lot of evidence in here that's improper evidence. Does that refresh your memory? Yes. What was that finding? So our conclusions from that uh, were the um, in that conversation they expressed that the production team, meaning Gabrielle Pickle and her peers, um, had received reports that uh, firearms were being left unattended. And, this is all um, hearsay. All of it's hearsay. Ms. Gutierrez Reed's uh, response to that. And I want you to tell me what her response was. I want to okay. talk about your finding based on her response. The finding was that an employee <laughs> expressed that this was a very okay, serious safety-related job and that they needed time to conduct that effectively. Fair. Um, and, and that was your finding? Your finding was that what? That Russ... We consider that heightened awareness. An employee is informing management that there is a safety concern or that they have an issue with something. And it is then on management to then take that concern and do something about it. In this scenario, it resulted in no response. Okay, thank you. Okay. 
Did you pass the witness? Excuse. Thank you. Next how, are we, how are we supposed to know if you don't pass the witness? Kristen says, but it's hearsay that was communicated in email. So it's still. Yeah, it's called Robert Genoway. Robert, I think she said Genoway. I'm going to zoom, zoom. I'm going to get to questions when we get to a court break. There will be one. Uh, this looks like another expert. Do you agree with this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Have a seat talking to the microphone. We are in the defense case. We are on their Mr. second Jerry, witness. Please, um, just tell the jury how you were employed. Yeah, his so, name, counsel. Name? His name on the record. Get the name. Um, can you please um, state and spell your name for the jury? Uh, Robert Genoway. That's R O B E R T G E N O W A Y. Yes. Mr. Genoway, how are you employed? I am the bureau chief for the Environment Department's Occupational Health and Safety Bureau, also known as New Mexico OSHA. Another OSHA and, expert. Uh, what What do you do as the bureau chief? I oversee all of the uh, OSHA operations for the state, including overseeing our compliance and enforcement program. I'm so frustrated that the prosecutor didn't ask, have you ever investigated a movie set before? Are you aware of the roles on a movie set? Are you aware of the roles of the armor? Are you aware of the, uh, that an armor can stop filming if they, or, or halt production if they do not have enough time? Like they didn't ask the OSHA folks, any of this. OSHA has a job. OSHA's job is workplace safety. OSHA's, OSHA's job is to find employers, not employees, if the employers are unsafe. The employers here were unsafe. All of this sucks for all their civil cases. But for Hannah's case and Baldwin's case, I don't know if it helps. I think it might help Baldwin's case more than it helps Hannah's case because it's questionable whether Baldwin's job is to check the gun or not. That's a different question. It's not questionable that it's Hannah's job to check the gun. So here we are. Are you, um, in the terms of hierarchy, is there anybody ahead, above you? Not within the OSHA Bureau. Uh, I report to the division Stephanie director. Stephanie Zoom in the chat said, OSHA uh, said TLDR equals our, fuckery um, afoot. Yeah. Cabinet secretary. Dangerous fuckery. And do you supervise, uh, we just heard from Mr. Montoya. Do you supervise Mr. Montoya? Uh, not directly, um, but I am in the chain of command over Mr. Montoya. And uh, how... How, How is you, this relevant? Um, did you review Mr. Mon Montoya's report in this case? Yes, I did. Here's I. And what is the, can you explain the process of how that uh, review happens once the report is, is finalized? What happens with it? Uh, well, I work with the, the inspector throughout the, the course of an investigation. What is the relevance of the supervisor? Um, and once a draft report is produced by the inspector, then um, it will go through a level, various levels of management review. Uh, Can and for we all stipulate that management didn't do their job? I agree to that. Uh, I would, yeah, I would normally review the entire case file, including um, a narrative report and and other portions of the case file, to um, ensure that if we're issuing citations, that uh, they meet with um, certain requirements of legal sufficiency. Okay. So you and reviewed the entire case file. What what is in that case file? Stuff. Uh, the case file will contain documentation obtained from an employer. Um, also, may contain documentation from other sources, uh, medical investigator reports, interviews, um, any type of police reports that are available at the time, um, photographs, uh, audio recordings, interviews of employees and other Sir, witnesses. Do you go to your employees um, and say, "Look and, at um, this photograph," and, uh, or and no? The documents that are produced by our bureau, including I feel like no uh, inspection report and narrative. I feel like maybe no. And and when you review that and review the report, in this case, did you review Mr. Montoya's report pertaining to the fatality at the rest. I saw a great comment in the chat. October 21st, 2021. L. Lambert said, and there should be records of the daily safety meetings. Um, see, part of the problem is there weren't daily safety meetings, like ever. That was definitely not Hannah's job. That was Dave Hall's job. Dave Hall's already pled and already served his six months of unsupervised uh, probation for a uh, misdemeanor. Um, but yeah, there should be records of all the safety meetings, but Dave Halls didn't do any of the safety meetings. Yes. And did you concur with that report? Yes. Did you make any changes to that report? Sometimes. 
uh, I'm sure that any report will go through you know, minor editorial changes again to ensure that we are, you know, to, to content meets with legal sufficiency. To make sure that we don't have an entire document with people's names spelled wrong. Look, there's process. I appreciate how thorough OSHA is and their processes. Prior to issuance of a citation. However. So yes, I'm sure I, there were some minor changes that were made during the review process. And Dave Halls won't be charged later. OSHA's His plea was this, mentioned when what, he testified. What exactly is it that, that your bureau is investigating and looking for? Um, employers that are yeah, sucking at being employers to determine whether any violations of OSHA statute and regulations caused or contributed to uh, the accident that's being investigated. And ultimately, whose determination was it um, whether or not to cite breast productions with any violations? It was mine. What types of standards do you hold them to? Um, well, we would, of course, look for violations of any OSHA standards that apply to the work site that's being inspected. Um, there's a whole range of standards that, that apply, um, but we also, in addition to, to standards, most of which are, are uh, incorporated at the state level from federal OSHA standards, um, but the act itself, our statute, our governing statute also includes general language requiring employers to, to provide a safe workplace. Is there any OSHA standard specific to, to firearm safety on a movie set? No. Then do you have to look at industry standards on that? What and we did look you? at I is know whether or not um, the hazard uh, associated with firearms is recognized either within the industry or specifically uh, by the employer uh, at the work site to determine whether that employer um, should have or could have uh, known about a hazardous condition and taken actions to to correct that condition. Should they have known that firearms are hazardous? Did, what yes. types of were you provided any, or did you? I mean, same with horses. Any industry standards pertaining to the hazard of a firearm on a movie set in this case? Um, yes, uh, I, I mean, in particular, we looked at um, safety bulletins that are uh, produced by uh, jointly by the industry and um, and uh, collected collective bargaining. Uh, um, bodies that contributed to that, to, to, to those. So uh, Doug brought up something in the chat. A lot of you have said no standards for firearms on a movie set. OSHA doesn't have standards for that. The industry has standards for that. So you've also got unions that deal with movie sets and movie production, and you've got multiple. Um, you've got IATSE and the Writers Guild and the Directors Guild and sag after and IATSE and SAG probably have more regulations on these things because they're dealing with people on set in a different way than the writer's guild or the director's guild, but they have standards. OSHA doesn't have standards. I mean, OSHA California might have standards or because they have more movie sets, but he's saying OSHA doesn't specifically have standards for that because it's kind of a niche thing, but the industry itself should have standards for that. And then they look to the industry standards. So OSHA doesn't have its own standards because this is not a regular occurrence. So what does the industry standard say? And they should be taking advisement from the industry safety standards from the movie industry. Hopefully that makes sense. So it's, it's because it's niche bulletins as well. Do you believe that the, and it was not union, but it was a union was shoot. So the union yes. rules should still Why do you apply. Uh, well, I've overseen uh, the work of Mr. Montoya for several years leading up to this uh, investigation. I, I know his work to be thorough uh, and in reviewing the report, um, I found that um, that our investigator um, went to great lengths to to collect as much evidence as possible prior to producing the report. And um, he's breathing right do on you that microphone. Happen to recall how many interviews were done into my ear holes by you or by OSHA? I don't recall. No. Um, did you find any fault in the way the investigation was done by Mr. Montoya? No. Yeah, my understanding okay. is that OSHA has about six months to complete its its investigation, and that in this case, uh, Santa Fe Sheriff's Department hadn't provided your bureau with a copy of their report. Is that right? That's my recollection. Yes. That report wasn't provided until after you issued after the report was issued. 
I believe that's correct, yes. These so, police reports um, took forever that, in this case. I guess, how can you, do you believe that the reviewing the Santa Fe Sheriff's report is necessary to come to the findings that your office came to? No. Why? Um, because we're looking at, um, at uh, an employer's responsibilities specifically under the OSHA Act, which is separate from criminal law enforcement. Right. And what are the specific, um, are, you, are you looking for any violations of safety rules that the employer engaged in? Yes. So who is it that decided to issue the citation in this case? I did. And, and we agree with you, sir. Of the, the fine that was levied against Russ Production? Um, the initial proposed penalty was 130 some thousand. I don't recall the the exact amount, but it was 130 some thousand dollars. Okay. And how is that amount? How is that amount chosen? Chat would have liked Based to have on the uh, statutory more. maximum provided in in OSHA in the OSHA Act. You cannot do so that. Russ levied the statutory maximum maximum fine provided in the the OSHA Act for its violations of workplace safety. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, the money should go to the state of New Mexico. But this is very bad for Rust for the civil cases, right? EDB, what were charges brought morning. against Baldwin and then dropped? We'll talk about that at a break um, when we have a chance. I suppose we'll talk about sentencing at a break here. when we have a chance. You're not conducting a criminal investigation at OSHA, are you? No. So the things that you're looking for for the purposes of your investigation may not be the same things that law enforcement may be, may be looking for as part of their investigation, correct? I believe that to be the case. Great. Um, yeah, OSHA could have shut down I the set, you, but you this happened and then filming stopped um, and then they filmed elsewhere. interviews and documentation and uh, Mr. Montoya's report. Um, as part of that, did you form an opinion as to whether Ms. Gutierrez's actions as an armor contributed to the breakdowns that Jessica, occurred I'll get on to the that. set? Um, No. Um, do you recall giving a, a recorded statement uh, during a pretrial interview in this case? Oh. I don't recall being interviewed at the trial. Mm -hmm. um, you don't recall giving a... You don't recall being interviewed at all? Sir, would it refresh your recollection if we cue that bad boy up right now? Because now I'm curious. A Zoom interview in this case. With my on face? February 5th, 2004. I'm sorry, did you repeat the date? 2004? Uh, I'm sorry, 2024, so February 5th, 2024. Sir, like no, a month ago. Like a month okay. ago. You, you have no recollection of participating <laughs> in a uh, Zoom interview with it was last month. the last counsel month. for the state and Sir. Scott Elliott, an investigator for uh, Hannah Gutierrez? No. Play it. All right. Yeah. Oh, he's been summoned by Carrie. Play it. Impeach somebody with receipts. Just, just so Mr. we all know. Would, would, would it refresh your memory if I showed you a transcript of that uh, that interview? It might help. May I approach? Yeah. Yeah. Now all the attorneys are talking the together. The not, I, don't, I don't know if this will help you, but the date, the correct date of the interview is November 7th, 2023. That's a really big fucking difference. November 7th, 2023 is not even synonymous or close to February 5th, 2024. Was counsel thinking of the wrong guy? Probably. I don't recall ever counsel? doing the interview. Okay. That is... Yeah, I think he had the wrong date for the wrong witness, which is kind of funny. But he's like, can I just show you this shit on my computer? Oh, my God. Sir, is this not you? I'm waiting for this witness to be like, that's not my name. <laughs> just, I'm, I'm not Zoom Zooming because I'm waiting to see this dude's face. All right, Chad, I'm going to answer some questions. Carrie, Carrie's like, you gave the wrong date. Yes, Carrie definitely summoned him uh, for sure. Melly said, EDB, why were charges brought against Baldwin and then dropped? Well, and then brought again, I have no idea why they chose to do that. Um, it certainly sounds like, sounds like uh, 
responses I would have provided, but I have to say honestly that I don't really Oh, his recollection is not refreshed at all. He's like, no. Jessica asked, can we talk about Bravo lawsuits? That's going to be the podcast, the Emily show this week. I'm going to talk about the two most recent Bravo lawsuits. Could Hannah Gutierrez be considered self-employed contractor? No. Of this interview, and then she was an employee of this film set. So she was an employee and uh, the contractor laws have changed uh, particularly in California and elsewhere. So no, they are employees. I'm going to get through some more questions. Question, can they use Alec Baldwin's police interview without him testifying? In his trial, yes. Watched it last night and he said Hannah did her checks well and called out. They can't use it in this case. Um, they can only use it in his case. So, no. Thank you for the gift of memberships. Is she remanded or is she out on bond? Hannah is out on her own recognizance. Um, Brandy said, I don't remember what side wanted the OSHA report out. Does this open the door? Are you, are you asking me to read that? I'm just asking the prosecution was trying to keep it out and they lost. Questions. Okay. So it's in now. Well, here. findings from the OSHA report are in. Okay. Oh, yes. Sorry. The report's Sorry. not in. Thank you. Yeah. Carrie, thank you for the gift of memberships. I object to the lack of objections at this trial fair. Jay Michaels, Jade, hi Jade, said, hi Emily, I'm at home with dad watching you. Thanks Jade, good to see you in the chat. So, um, Jonathan said, I can see the defense logic they expect. Um, the expert armorer said there's no industry standard for safety and that's each set is different, meaning that management on Rust didn't set the standards properly for Hannah to follow. And it, it is a good point. I mean, they have an argument to argue that everyone else was so reckless that she couldn't be reckless because she was in such a reckless environment that it's not on her. Mr. That's Chairman, hard, that but it's not you, impossible. You Some of the jurors might be like, yeah, I get that. Ms. Gutierrez, her actions contributed to the breakdown that occurred on the set? Yes. All right. Heather, it's an I'm excellent ask point. You a couple questions about. Um, and if you have jurors that work in positions where there are things they cannot do with management approval, even if they want to, you might have some jurors that are very empathetic to Hannah, and and see um, and see this as a failure on management, saying, you know what, she actually could not do her job safely, so she's not reckless in doing her job. She's not reckless in doing her job at all. Management was so reckless. That's their best argument. If they try to get into the, like, she's just a girl situation, I'm out. But I think it's a good argument. She could not have been reckless in doing her job because the set was so bad. It's a strong argument. But it's also a nuanced argument when you get to a criminal case when you have to deal with negligence. The, in, the investigatory materials that you... Paralegal, reviewed, Erica, I agree with you. Um, you... You already indicated you do not have a copy of the uh, Santa Fe Sheriff's Office report, correct? I'm not sure whether we obtained one after issuing our citations. And and to be clear, I'm talking about as you as OS or OHSB conducted its investigation and issued its findings, you did not have the benefit of the Santa Fe Sheriff's Office investigatory report to assist you with that, correct? Correct. All right. And did you um, did you have the benefit of reviewing any uh, behind the scenes videos that were filmed on the set of Rust? Not that I can recall. Do you recall if you reviewed any footage from the filming of the Rust movie cameras? No. Um, did you uh, engage the assistance of any expert armorers? uh for your purposes of your investigation oh that uh, mike we didn't we didn't engage your contract we had some brief discussions with potential experts but we never actually engaged those experts you never so you never relied on any of their opinions to form to inform your investigation no okay um i know that you were asked some questions about um Determining Daniel, I don't think you're alone. against employers. So we try is to keep it an open mind. That OSHA's purview is not to assess fines uh, against individual employees. That's correct. So is it is it also fair to say then that even if you found that there had been some uh, 
concerning conduct by an employee, you wouldn't have fined that employee, correct? Correct. Nishe, I say go for it. Thank you. Nothing further. Even if the employee had been at fault, you wouldn't have fined the employee, right? That's not what OSHA does. That's like literally not their job. So this is this is some of the defenses. But would you have strongest said in your witnesses. report that a specific employee failed to to do something if that's what you determined? In most cases, no. Now, did Rust afford in this case the armor with? Uh, sufficient time to thoroughly inventory the ammunition. Objection. Calls for speculation. Sure does. She 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 makes the same face every time he objects. She's like, "Why are you objecting? We don't do that here." My face has been that way the whole trial when people don't object. So I get it. I wish they would stay up at sidebar so we could see the demeanor of the attorneys in the face of the judge. There we go. With respect to the bureau's finding there we go i'm going to ask you with respect to the bureau's finding um did did the bureau the oshb bureau find that that rust failed to afford the armor with time to thoroughly inventory the ammunition i don't know if i recall that specifically what i do recall is that um, our investigation determined that uh, in, from my recollection, more in general, that um, sufficient time for armor. Would armor it refresh duties. your memory to look at the report? Yes. Um, page seven. Said he uh, didn't remember. I'm, I'm going to object to that. Okay. It's not his report. To refresh his memory, he said it would help him. I bet it's not his report. Back to sidebar. There is something they really want to get in. Whoever in the audience has that glorious pop socket, I really like it. I just caught a quick glimpse of it and got distracted. I bet it's not his report. Do you remember the exact wording of the specific finding in the report pertaining to affording the armor time on inventory? Probably not. Of ammunition? No. But refresh your memory to look at the report. Yes. Okay, um, page seven. Your Honor, may I approach? Yes. It, I, I agree that it's hearsay, but um, mm. does that refresh your memory? Yes. Deja Lee Four said, "Emily, it's my sister-in-law who has the pop socket in court. It's glorious." Find that Rust failed to just, afford the armor time to thoroughly just caught it in the background. The yes. I love a sparkly pop socket. Did Rust find? that, uh, I mean, did OSHB find that Rust did not par for provide the armor with the authority to determine if additional training was required in violation of Rust safety procedures? Huh? I recall that the investigation found that sufficient time wasn't provided by but Rust. It was not provided, is that what you said? Sufficient time was not provided by Rust. Okay. He did approve so, the report. The questioning is just getting um, really muddy. And were there and also covering up a findings good point. by OSHB that um, despite efforts by employees that Rust ignored some of the safety concerns? Yeah, it's leading AF. <clears throat> it's your witness, ma'am. She's like, Ugh. the prosecutor got away with it. Yeah, they did. And you didn't. This, this attorney is going to object. It's leading AF. We can't do any of this. For all of you getting confused, imagine how the jury feels. And we get to fast forward and we're on 1.25 speed. Imagine the jury feels like they are having a root canal What was your morning. understanding of the, the arrest findings with respect to um, whether safety concerns were... Um, that were brought to rest's attention. Oh, they ignored them. Correctly. Asked and answered. Right. Our investigation found that um, Russ uh, failed to um, adequately uh, re review uh, safety um, oversights on the set and uh, so that they could take necessary action to prevent 
recurrence. So when you're asked on cross um, about a statement you gave in some pretrial interview about Ms. Gutierrez um, contributing to a breakdown on the set, why is it that you believe that's possible? Oh, it's well, not. We would look for an I thought we were at 1.25. My bad. Whether acts on the part of employees are, are we're there now on the part of an employer. It was so slow. Um, that's it was part of a determination of um, what we call employer not the employer knowledge aspect of a violation. Okay, now so it's that's better. why we would look at that type of information. Okay, and in this case, did you determine whether the breakdowns from Gutierrez um, were? I forgot. I went due back to, to the act of the employer. This is better. Yes, we determined that you know, those breakdowns. Um, um, were caused by failures of the employer to to adequately oversee safety. Thank you. That is the most important part of his testimony. Hold on, I'm going to go back to normal speed. This should be the theme of their closing argument. I'm going to back up real quick because it took a whole lot of fumbling around in the dark to get to this answer. And I don't know if by the time we have fumbled around in the dark to get to this answer that the jury is even still paying attention because chat, are you even still without me yelling at you periodically? Of employees I get it. Are, are preventable on the part of an employer. Um, that's you know, as part of a determination of uh, what we call employer not the employer knowledge aspect of a violation. So that's why we would look at that type of information. Okay, and in this case, did you determine whether the breakdowns from Gutierrez um, were due to any act of the employer? Yes, we determined that you know, those breakdowns. Um, um, were caused by failures of the employer to to adequately oversee safety. Thank you. That's the most important part of his testimony. No further questions. Say that before you walk off. All right, sir, you're excused. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Next witness. Sure. The most important part of OSHA Jude's testimony. <clears throat> The breakdowns of Hannah Gutierrez were as a result of the employer's failure to supervise. That is what he said. So that is what the defense is really going to hang their hat on when determining whether or not Hannah Gutierrez was negligent in doing her job. Remember, there are two parts to involuntary manslaughter. One, that she was doing something lawful, but did it in a way that was negligent or reckless. And then two, that she was doing something unlawful, the negligent handling of a firearm. So the jury gets to pick one or two. So uh, let's zoom, zoom through this so we can catch up with real time. Unless the court's going to go for lunch. I hope not, just because we've barely started this morning. Yeah, I'll get our next witness. Okay. Great. Who is it? I'm going to zoom, zoom. Oh, we're, we're caught up. We are now on real time. There is no more. There is no more zoom, zoom to zoom, zoom. Um, Diane asked, I'm having a hard time following with this attorney. Am I alone? No. This morning's been uh, frustrating. Um, for gossip, rumors, and innuendo, thank you for the one gifted membership. Question, has the source of live rounds been explained? The prosecution's arguing that it came from Hannah. Has that been clear? Clear as mud. They have not made it very clear, but that's where we're at. Defense didn't object during state case, hoping state wouldn't during their case. Yeah, that's not how lawyering Please works, but under maybe. penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right, have a seat. Talk into the microphone. The judge is like, are we done yet? Carla said hello from London. A colleague hello, in the sir. office said YouTube was done, and I said not possible. Scott Elliott. Mr. Elliott, what do you do for a living currently? I'm currently a private investigator. And Mr. Elliott, prior to becoming a private investigator, did you have a career in law enforcement? Yes. If this dude does not bring all of the motherfucking tea, I am going to be so disappointed. Who is the PI following around and what did he find out? And I counsel, I was so let down personally in my soul by the lack of fireworks for the cross-examination of Seth Kinney. I, I'm going to need some tea. I want to know what this PI was following and what he did. Yes, I did. How Can do we have a PI jury, in this case? Uh, what your career was in law enforcement? How many years? 
Uh, military and civilian or just? Uh, let's start with civilian <laughs> and we'll work back. Okay. He's uh, like, let me back up. I was hired by the Albuquerque Police Department and I attended the academy starting in February of 1993. I retired in 2011. Uh, during that time period, I started out field services, normal uniform patrol. Uh, I went to the gang unit. Um, then I became a violent crimes detective in about 1995-96. And in 1998, it became a homicide detective. And I was a homicide detective when I retired in 2011. File a complaint with the defense. Excuse so me. So you, you spent approximately feisty cross -examination. Like 13 years in homicide division? Part of that was interrupted by post-9-11 deployment, but yes. At post-9-11, did you deploy overseas? I did. And, and was that part of Are your you moving into your military, part of your military duties? Yes, it was. Okay. Sir, how many, as part of your homicide uh, uh, portion of your APD employment, approximately how many investigations do you think you worked on uh, in homicide? As a case agent, 35 or 40, um, assisting on homicides, 150, 200. And, and this is just homicides. You, you probably had 150, 200 in terms of violent uh, crime or other types of narcotics or any types of, how many investigations? Oh, do you Teresa, think you this case is wearing my nerves. Do you even have an estimate? We're on day nine of nerve. I don't think so. Um, I became detective in 1995, uh, hundreds of cases a year. And then by the time I was in violent crimes, it was slightly reduced, but um, that was all violent crime short of homicide. So lots of those. And, and you also talked about your military service. Can you tell us very briefly about whether you had um, uh, law enforcement type experience with the military? I've gained yeah, that so was, sound a little bit. I was I'm commissioned in 1981 to to in the infantry. Cut some of that. I spent approximately 10 years resident uh, on active duty. Um, various various duties uh, as part of the active duty time. And then in we're doing background training experience. Active duty in 1992 and 1993 started with the police department. We're zoom zooming. Uh, then sorry. I transferred into the reserves. Um, in Albuquerque, there was not an infantry unit anywhere nearby. So I did, was an engineer officer for a little while, and then I became a secondary specialty of military policemen. And I worked in those functions until I transferred from the Army in 2003 to the Air Force. Uh, when I transferred to the Air Force, I took command of what's called a Heavy Weapons Squadron, which was a security forces unit, which is Air Force Police. Um, the difference with that unit is that they had weapon systems that are normally found in the Army. Uh, mortars, snipers. Uh, so we're fascinated by your launchers, career. Things like that. So my prior Army career folded right into that unit and its mission. So, so How you, often you were you dealing with grenade launchers in New Mexico, sir? Is that, is that correct? Yes, that's true. Okay. And Your Honor, at this time, I tendered Mr. Elliott as an expert in quality of investigations, law enforcement investigations? Um, I don't know if that's what he said. I think he's probably really qualified uh, as a weapons expert, but they're trying to tender him as an expert regarding police procedure and, quote, quality of investigation, which I have literally never heard anyone try to qualify someone for quality of investigation. Police procedure, yes. Quality of investigation? No, I'm not surprised there's an objection. Oh, sure. The quality of law enforcement investigations? No objection. Huh. All right. Uh, he's an expert. Sure. Described. Mr. Elliott, uh, can you tell Everyone's the jury specifically cool. what did you uh, do in this particular case? Just an overview scope. He, okay. Well, I reviewed all the discovery. Sure. Um, all the reports, videos, uh, any documentation, any evidence uh, that included going in physically looking at the evidence in this case. In addition to that, I interviewed uh, the majority of the state's witnesses in what's called pretrial interviews. Um, I think the only ones I didn't interview were the FBI employees. You recall ballpark? Did you want to many, though? Uh, did you want to ask them why they hit that gun with the hammer? I bet you did. Hmm. I wanted to ask them that too. 35, 40 maybe. And in terms of the reports, uh, did you review voluminous reports in this case as well? Yes, I did. And have you as an expert um, 
also made He's some hired conclusions by the defense. based on your review of the materials, your interviews, We're in the defense case. and what you've seen in this case. I did. Okay. I, I don't want to hit every <laughs> um, point that you might make, but I want to hit some said he's of like the a major ones. But for First of all, at the scene, um, at the initial scene when law enforcement responds, can you tell the jury, do you have any conclusions um, about the quality of the investigation by the sheriffs at the scene? Yeah, some of that was reached by my own observations and some of it through interviews of the deputies on the scene. He just asked if, um, if he I never asked like him if he's ever been was qualified as an expert before. Probably not what it should be. Um, Did you take into there consideration? Were, yes, there, there were hundreds of, of people on that ranch. Yep. But if you narrow it down to who was in the church at the time of the shooting and who may have had involvement with the case, for example, the people that were just outside, uh, there was really about 20 people. How long did it take um, them to determine the that, though? First responding deputies, their job is first preservation of life, and then it is preservation of evidence and identifying witnesses and possible suspects. Um, in this case, uh, it was known very quickly who the shooter was, but it wasn't known Baldwin. who the witnesses were. And those witnesses, once they were identified, um, they should have been segregated so they couldn't talk among themselves. Now, let me stop you right there. When Baldwin you initially, have been on his as a phone, law enforcement agreed. homicide detective or somebody going on scene, you identify the shooter. What, what, in your opinion, is one of the first things that you should do? Well, the first thing you do is put someone with that individual, uh, segregate them from everyone else. Uh, you also want to, those individuals, since you are preserving evidence, you also want to secure their cell phones. Now, in this case, in the materials you reviewed, did it appear to you? Sir, can you tell me by what rules law enforcement is allowed to just like take everybody's cell phone? I really do need to know um, where in the Fourth Amendment that's allowed because honestly, as a former prosecutor, if they could just yoink everybody's cell phone, it really would make prosecutions easier. But I think the Constitution's uh, pretty set in its ways against just being able to like search personal property um, whenever. So... I've got a lot of questions. You that Mr. Baldwin was segregated. Not at all. Yeah, the and, way they treated Baldwin um, was stupid. Along with the conclusion you just stated, did it appear that Agreed. his cell phone was taken from him? No, it was not. Uh, Mr. Elliott, did it appear to you uh, that at any time at the scene that they, Mr. Baldwin was segregated? He was not. Yeah. Yeah. Next, you talked they about... They just let Baldwin um, do whatever. It was so weird. key witnesses and... and uh, preserving evidence. Can you explain that a little more? Yes. Um, nope. Well, the, the scene was secure. You don't often have a scene of that small of, of an environment. Um, it was known immediately that the shooting occurred inside that church structure and that it probably involved uh, Alec Baldwin. a couple of people just outside near that, that uh, weapons cart. Um, so that was the immediate concern, that area there. And the deputies, um, one of the early responding deputies, did get a pretty good list of who was in the church yep. and gave that to the lieutenant. But those individuals were not segregated from everybody else. Um, they were able to mingle with people who were not on scene, who were in a different part of the ranch. They did tell them to stay um, apart from each other. They conversations just, were taking place. Nobody listened. People were talking on cell phones. Um, and it's really unknown who they were talking to. And what is the danger um, or what is the concern? I think it's probably known who Baldwin was talking to because now they have a cell phone record. So, yeah. On the part of an investigator when suspects or witnesses are talking. None of these people were under. Victoria in the chat said police have the right to take your cell phone if you are under arrest. However, they cannot search your phone without consent or a search warrant. Yes, I am Victoria aware, but nobody was under arrest. At the point he's talking about when they're securing the scene, this witness testified they should have secured everyone's cell phones. No one was under arrest. They were trying to keep the witnesses separate. They had no cause, no probable cause to take people's cell phones. So uh, yes, I agree with you, but nobody was under arrest. And even when they went into the police station, no one was under arrest. No one was arrested that day. No one was arrested until months later and charged. So no one was under arrest at all, including Alec Baldwin. So that's part of the problem here is that because nobody was under arrest, people were operating under this being a a um a accident so they couldn't legally take their phones okay that well, is a couple point. things one people could be getting their story straight 
The other is it, it causes witnesses to misremember what they did and what they saw. Because uh, in my experience, good, honest citizens try to help. They could have been detained, and they'll they tell you something that their neighbor told them, as if it was there, something that they saw. Uh, and it is just human nature that if, if you talk about something over and over and over again, eventually there are parts of it that you think that you did, and it was what someone else did. So you want to clean, even if it's very brief and they didn't see very much or they didn't hear very much. You want a clean uh, statement of, of what their knowledge is. Okay, um, and with regard to uh, whether if that is not done, um, what can that lead to? What is your conclusion about what can happen? Matthew, if thank you for the gifted membership. You're to talk to people. Well, one, you, you can um, delete things off your phone. Yep. You can delete photos. Yep. Uh, it wasn't known at the time if somebody was videotaping what was going on inside on their phone. That's possible. Um, I mean, it's a movie case you work. Now, someone rules. has videotaped it with their phone. Did you also determine, and, and this is a, another point, but that someone had left the scene and, and whether that person had been identified? As far as I know, they still have not been identified. Okay. Um, with regard to securing the prop card on that scene, what is your opinion as to whether that was appropriately handled? No, it should have remained in place. Um, there was an individual, uh, Brian, um, was told to, told to go get the cart. He went out of sight behind the church, on the other side of the church, and then he moved the cart around towards the lieutenant's uh, marked unit. That should not have been done. As well, what there is your opinion There should have been more officers to, on scene, uh, but there the, weren't. Or do you have any concerns about how the evidence on top of the prop cart was handled? Well, Sam, Lieutenant Benavides, the echo on the uh, mic's killing me. Took possession of the yeah. firearm with an ungloved hand, and he grabbed it right around the cylinder. So the Let's largest portion of the revolver is how he picked up the revolver, put it into his vehicle. At another occasion, pulled it out of his vehicle and put it back on the cart. He did the same thing with the ammo boxes from the uh, cart. So you definitely can't preserve evidence by touching things with your bare hands, but it also could have damaged anything that was on the the boxes or the firearm prior to him handling it. Yes, accurate. All of this is true. However, there's no, there's no question that Baldwin had the gun when Helena was shot. There's no question that this was the armor on set who was touching the gun. Like who had the gun is not a question. Who loaded the gun is not a question. Who had the ammo is not a question because so many other people touched it. So is it proper procedure? No. Is it ideal circumstances? No. Could law enforcement have done things better? Yes. But at the end of the day, does it matter? Probably not. Now, working our way through this. Um, but if, that's their job. Uh, Doubt, right? This is the defense's job. Thrown away. Hey, look, everybody um, else messed up. That's their job. Uh, what is the, do you have any concerns at this point with how the police responded to that? The sheriff's responded to that matter. Well, it's my understanding that they were notified quite late. I think it was a month later. Um, but I didn't see any attempt to go out and see if they were still in trash at the ranch. And, and is that something in, in your normal investigation when you were doing homicide investigations, you want to collect all of the potential evidence? Well, in this case, uh, I think they thought it was an the, accident. Law enforcement was told very almost immediately this was the firearm used. Yep. But the projectile can't be matched to a firearm. And I know there are at least three 45 long Colt revolvers on that cart that day. So although the casing has been tested to match the firearm that was presented to law enforcement, there's no way to know that projectile positively came from that firearm. It was in Baldwin's hand and he pulled the trigger. What, the, what the more would you were, like, sir? We're um, thrown away. Um, did you have any other concerns on the follow-up with regard to identifying the source of that live Correct. Round. They did not search the, the live rounds that appeared on set. And they didn't. That didn't seem to be followed up on uh, very strongly. Um, a lot wasn't followed up on very strongly. It, it's, it's a little confusing when rounds came onto the set or the scene, the, the ranch. And the job of this witness is to poke holes. So he is trying to poke holes. So for all of you that are like, I am confusion, 
That is the goal of this witness. The goal of this witness is I am confusion. Because how do you convict someone if you are confusion? That is doubt. So that is his job. That's what they're doing. Who brought them? It seemed that there were a number of times that at least one occasion, I thought it was more that Sarah went to PDQ in Albuquerque and brought ammo back. Uh, there was the initial ammo provided by PDQ. And then there was some ammo provided by uh, Ms. Gutierrez. And did you identify any other investigative steps that you think uh, should have been taken to try to um, further look into the source of the live rounds? Well, there's been a lot of talk about the white boxes with the JS. Uh, that individual has never been interviewed, the producer of the ammunition. Um, so there really was no backtracking of where the ammo came from. You can't say this ammo on the prop cart definitively where it came from. You can't say the ammunition in the prop truck definitively where it came from. These lawyers are um, my head. There should have been more work done in that area. Yes. And, and when you're in a situation. There should have been more work done to find out where everything came from. There should have been more work done to track everything back. There simply wasn't. I don't disagree. But I think law enforcement looked at all the interviews they had where Hannah's telling them, I brought ammo from here. And Seth Kinney's telling them, I brought ammo from here. And they're like, well, people told us the things and we're good. A situation like this is a former homicide detective. When you're trying to trace the root cause of, of I don't think anyone uh, really treated this uh, as a homicide. They treated this through. as a workplace Isn't accident something first. That would, is that honestly. something that would be important to you to find out where the live round originated from? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Yeah, so this case is also a little unusual in the sense that it wasn't really a who done it. It was yes. a why done it and how done it. Um, by that, I mean, how did live rounds get on set? You don't know anybody there. You go out as an investigator. You're trying to find out what happened. Um, was there an argument on set? Was somebody angry? Did somebody have a mental break? Uh, is there some underlying relationship that may have been the root cause of the shooting? You don't know. And that's why an investigation is conducted to find out those things. And it's also to trace how the, that firearm came to be where it came to be. Okay, sir, and, and with regard to the search of the prop truck that occurred after the 21st, on the 27th, did you have any concerns with the delay in that search warrant? Oh, absolutely. Um, the There were firearms missing from the, the weapons cart. Uh, they had been moved from between the shooting and the arrival of law enforcement, and they were moved into the safe, into the prop truck. That should have been part of an expanding scene. Um, like I said, you had the church and the area immediately outside of it. But as soon as it became known the prop truck had an involvement with that shooting, the prop truck should have been uh, secured, just like you saw. The and I think, and this is something law enforcement also has to be careful of. I've never worked in law enforcement. It is not an easy job. I have done very limited training with law enforcement and found myself incredibly stressed going through like the FATS simulator on like dynamic situations. I was like, this shit's really, really stressful. Um, but the 911 call from the script supervisor was very clear there was an accidental shooting on the movie set like everyone who called law enforcement all the information they had when they showed up was that this was an accidental shooting even joel souza the victim who had the other gunshot wound said um this couldn't have been a shooting this couldn't have happened people were in disbelief of what happened so they were trying to parse it out and law enforcement was like there was an accident something went wrong and we need to try to figure it out. So I don't think they came into the scene thinking um, that this was this was motivated by something more. They started asking those questions later, but I think they were tr really looking at this through the lens of that 911 call. This is an accident. Crime scene tape, deputy placed there, nobody allowed in the truck until such time as you can do a search warrant. In addition, uh, with regard to the search warrant of, of Seth Kenny's business, PDQ Props, did you have any concerns about the delay of approximately a month? And searching that business oh, of course of course uh, exactly a delay Christine. of a few days could be it's an excellent point could be an issue but a month is their job is to raise doubt and from your re review of records in this case was it um uh, was it ascertainable that I mean, we've Kennedy got a we've got a twenty thousand person uh, jury it's great to see the conversation you guys are having i think it was known almost immediately um both by the people at the scene and mr kenny himself With respect to that delay in search warrant, there's some obvious things I think that would be apparent to anybody. Um, but 
why is that an issue? What were the primary issues that you want to do to try to secure a home and search it right away, secure a business, search it right away? What are, what are the reasons? Destruction of well, evidence. Preservation of evidence. Um, if no one can get inside the business, then no one can tamper with anything that's inside. Uh, and you hope to, to get everything. They didn't. The search warrant for PDQ happened a month later. That's what they're getting at now. What can happen in a month? Where can live ammo go in a month? Because the prosecution is saying the ammo on set has like the shoot loops and the ammo from Seth Kinney has like the, the blasty discs or whatever. And in a month, a lot of shit can change. Shit can disappear. And that's what they're saying. Like in a month, stuff at PDQ arm and prop could change. As it was as soon as you can. Yeah. Um, without that's a fair point. Alteration. With regard to Mr. Kinney, did you also have any concerns about uh, collection of DNA, fingerprints, um, things like that? I did. Um, those things can be used for elimination or positively identifying someone. Um, in the case of Mr. Kinney, if, if they had had his major case prints and had his, his DNA, and none of it was found on the boxes of ammunition, then it would eliminate him as somebody possibly being involved. They had his fingerprints. In your opinion, uh, in your experience as a, an investigator, would this have been something that you would expect to have been done, that the supplier of ammunition to rust, that he would also be looked at in that respect? They did. Yes, considering the environment. and I would have expected that he would have been cross-examined vigorously, but that was just my expectation. I have to deal with the, the my own expectations and not, not put those on everybody else. But um, Seth Kinney's fingerprints are in the system, so if they had run them and they came up, they would have come up. And they said they didn't DNA Seth Kinney because – he said he provided it all. So why try to DNA it? He said he provided it all. And then the ex we heard from the FBI with the expended uh, live round and then the other live rounds, why they can't DNA the live rounds. In fact, that there should not have been live rounds on set. Agreed. Now, with regard to Mr. Kenny, uh, did you also determine whether his phone had been seized to be extracted or whether that had been fully extracted? It was not. His phone was never... It was only partially What is your extracted. opinion on, on that? That's uh, not a full answer. Or, or... That's not a correct answer. That's not a correct answer, sir. Uh, this will come up on cross-examination, maybe. But his phone was partially extracted. It was not seized. It was a volunteer, just like Hannah's phone was volunteered. That fact that his phone was never taken for extraction. The contact between Sarah Zachary and he almost immediately after the shooting warranted that. Agreed. And are you speaking about the phone call right after the shooting where we heard testimony um, and there was a text emergency? Is that the time frame you're talking about? Yes, it is. Okay. And are you also aware that there were a number of calls that Seth Kenny, uh, other calls he was making in contact with Sarah Zachary? D dozens of calls. In your opinion, um, to do a complete investigation, to get the facts out, to get the truth on the table, was that something that you would expect to be done that they fully investigate Seth Kenny. Um, calls for expert conclusion. So you would, let him be um, an expert. Would you have expected, in your experience as a homicide detective, a full investigation of Mr. Kenny? I would have. Yes, especially considering that Sarah Zachary worked for him. Yeah, I would have. Agreed. to obtain Mr. Baldwin's phone early on and what happened after that? As I, as I said before, that would have been an immediate. Um, every deputy should have known that uh, as soon as he was identified as being the shooter. Agreed. And then, then my understanding is that he left the state with it and- The phone. Um, that forensic analysis was done uh, in New York. I should correct myself. The extraction was done in New York. And do you have any knowledge of whether um, all of the contents were obtained off of Mr. Baldwin's phone? I have no way of knowing that. <clears throat> Did you have a report? Did you review a report? We talked about the scene, um, some search warrants. We talked about phones, fingerprints, DNA. Did you have any other opinions or concerns about the quality of this investigation? Did I miss anything? Is that question. Sure, did I miss anything? One aspect of it that's still kind of a mystery to me is when the lieutenant arrived on the scene, first two things he asked for was the gun and the armor. Um, I thought that was a little unusual. He didn't seem to be the least concern, concerned of who the shooter was and what that individual status was. 
Um, they told him the shooter was it seems. into his marked unit, which is pretty common. Uh, also considering that you know she had some anxiety issues and so on. Uh, but it immediately became clear she was not free to leave. Whenever the lieutenant would leave his vehicle, he'd tell the deputy to keep an eye on her. Uh, and detective. I interpreted that. And chat, please tell me if you interpreted that differently. I interpreted keep an eye on her because she was having a full blown panic attack. And when she went to the restroom, she asked for somebody to go with her. I did not interpret keep an eye on her. She's not free to leave. I interpreted keep an eye on her because they were actually worried about her welfare um, because she was expressing that she felt responsible. She was expressing that like my career is over. Like she was freaking out. I think they were worried about her uh, safety. Uh, they never searched her though because she showed up at the police department with like rounds of like dummies and blanks in her pockets. They should have secured Baldwin too, for sure. But she was, um, I don't think being observed so she wouldn't wander off. I think it was for safety. Hancock got to the scene. She almost immediately took uh, going to the bathroom with her. So Hannah she clearly asked. was not free to leave. Every other individual on that ranch was free to walk around, talk to anyone, talk on their phone, do anything they wanted to do. And they shouldn't have been. Uh, I agree. Except Ms. Gutierrez. I agree. They shouldn't have. No, been. he talked about um, Baldwin should have been in a and, fucking cop car um, away situation. from everyone. In your experience, do you have any concerns about interviewing someone? Uh, if they could have only secured two or three people because of the minimum amount of police cars they had, they should have secured Baldwin off of his phone and away from everyone, Gutierrez off of his phone and away from everyone, and Dave Halls off of his phone and away from everyone. Those are the three people on set, once they identified who was in charge of what, that they should have that they should have kept separate and apart from everyone else. Other people in the church were helping stabilize patients and things like that, but those three, I think, should have been kept away um, from each other and everyone else for having conversations because they were the three involved. But it took law enforcement time to figure that all out. In the immediate aftermath of a traumatic situation. Objection. This homicide, this, this former homicide detective is not going to sit here and tell me you don't interview people in the wake of an immediate traumatic situation. It's why people shouldn't talk, but law enforcement absolutely interviews them. Australia, in the course of your career in both civilian and military law enforcement, have you encountered situations where people um, have been interviewed in traumatic situations? Yes, I have. And have you personally been involved in that? I have. And can you tell the jury, do you have any concerns uh, regarding interviewing an individual right after a traumatic situation? Yes. Uh, probably have started with, with a EMT or paramedic checking her, see if she was okay, see what her status was uh, health-wise. He asked you a question and it vaguely, and you're making it specific. I don't think there's going to be an objection though. Um, whether she was having, you know, hyperventilating or whatever symptoms her anxiety had to make sure she was okay that way. Um, because of confessions and the way those things can go, you're extra careful to make sure that someone is not uh, in a state that can later be uh, determined not to be a good mental state. And all your work in that confession or that statement are, is not admissible. Uh, so you try to avoid that if you can. <clears throat> And, and you said that that you would um, have that person uh, looked at in those situations by an EMT or a medical? Yes. What is the purpose of that again? Again, it's just to make sure that she's in a state where she can, or the individual's in a state where they can talk to you. Um, you want them to be as accurate as they can also. So if that causes a little bit of a delay before you can interview them, and they're still willing to be interviewed, you may get a more accurate statement from them. Okay. Thank you. And any, any other... Um, concerns about this investigation that we haven't hit on, Mr. Elliott? You may sir, have stated did, them all. I just wanted to sir, ask. Sir, did I forget else. anything? I don't think so. Did okay. you say anything else that was important? Cross-exam. Since this particular prosecutor has been running all of her direct examinations like a cross-examination, I'm actually really interested to see what her cross-examination style is. Because um, this is an expert, and I expect that she'll go in a little bit hot, but I guess we'll see. Mr. Elliott, isn't it true that you are the defense investigator on this case? It's true. Um, you work Obvi. for Mr. Bowles and Ms. Gutierrez, and they are paying you. That's correct. 
Um, How much were you paid? Is it more? As did he get paid more or less than the Photoshop guy? Chat, place your bets now. One for more, two for less. Did he get paid more or less than Photoshop guy? A person who is employed as the defense investigator, it is your job to aid in her defense. Isn't that true? That's true. Now, you seem to take issue with the fact that uh, Lieutenant Benavides touched the firearm with his ungloved hand. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Um, but you agree with me that unlike a lot of homicides or shootings, uh, this one occurred in the presence of upwards of a dozen people. That's true. So there was not going to be any mystery as to who had the gun and who pulled the trigger, correct? To that aspect, no. Uh, you seem to take issue with the fact that what I the said. projectile in this case can't be matched to the firearm, right? Only in the sense that to confirm that the firearm presented to law enforcement was the actual firearm. It doesn't really change uh, what happened. But where's the controversy? What, 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 do you have some stop, information no, that, the jury hasn't the heard that the gun that was fired by Mr. Baldwin is actually not the gun that was used? I haven't come across that. Do you? No, I was referring to when the arrived at the scene. They didn't know that other than what one person told them. Okay, but it turned out to be true. There's no controversy. The, the gun that was used in the shooting is the gun that was in Mr. Baldwin's hand, right? True. Okay. Um, and the reason that the projectile can't be matched to Carrie, you're moving too fast for me this morning. Uh, she is on a roll on cross-examination and no one's objecting. So these are the types of leading questions that you get into, but she's also now moving too fast, but she's kind of undoing his, his testimony. There's no controversy that this was the gun. Correct. Correct. Oh, so we cleared that up. Great. The firearm is because the projectile went through uh, two people and it was so heavily uh, uh, damaged because it went through two human beings, uh, there wasn't enough marking to match it to the bore of the gun. Isn't that true? That's true. Now, in terms of... I like her better on cross um, already. Fingerprints and DNA on the ammunition box. Sir, did you watch the video where Ms. Gutierrez actually any says possibility to Alex Judd wasn't the one fired no this is the box I was pulling from yes I did and that box is taken and put into Mr. Benavides's patrol unit correct the lieutenant placed it in his vehicle yes right so so where's the controversy in terms of what box she was pulling from Part of it was to find where the live ammo originated. That information may have been on the outside of the box. It could have had Seth Kenny's DNA, could have had Seth Kenny's fingerprints, or anyone else where the box came from. Because a lot of people touched but the box. Sir, didn't you watch the second interview with Ms. Gutierrez? Rexy Moto, she didn't slow down. I slowed down. I was on 1.25 speed and her questions were rolling too fast. So I had to slow down her cross. She, she's kind of made for cross. She likes, she likes doing this a lot better. Clearly she is much more comfortable doing cross examination than direct examination. Where she actually held and up. A she sounds annoyed, which is appropriate Corporal on Hancock cross. And said, this is a picture of our boxes of dummies. And not coincidentally, it matched identically to the box that she identified as the box that she was pulling rounds from that day. You watched that interview, didn't you? So yes, her tone uh, is definitely annoyed. It's just more appropriate on cross to have that tone of, sir, there's no controversy here. What are you even saying? We know Baldwin had the gun. We know she loaded the gun. What's the point of your testimony? Yeah, bye. Take our lunch break. Um, Your Honor, we were on a roll. Please be back by 1 30. Please don't talk among yourselves or anyone 1 else. 1 local the time, 2 30. Rise. 2 30 um, local time for me. This, this judge tends to be on the nose with lunch. 
Now we're going to lunch. I'm going to answer some questions um, as we get to lunch, and then we will we will uh, get back here after lunch all together. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let me pause this. Let's do a quick summary of the morning, shall we? That's not the right bumper, Emily. We are just wrapping up with the morning of day nine of the state versus Hannah Gutierrez. She is the armor on the set of Rust, where Alec Baldwin, I said that weird, where Alec Baldwin fatally shot and killed cinematographer Helena Hutchins. We are at the beginning of the defense's case. Yesterday, the prosecution rested. So far, the defense has called two folks from New Mexico OSHA and their defense investigator slash expert. The OSHA folks both said, look, we find Rust Movie Productions. Rust Movie Productions wasn't allowing for a safe work environment. They weren't heeding warnings about safety. They weren't holding safety meetings. And ultimately, the employer is responsible for not giving Hannah Gutierrez, the employee, the time she was requesting to do her job. So the OSHA report finding was, hey, the employer was fined because the employer wasn't giving her enough time to do her job, among other large and glaring issues. As I've said previously, that OSHA report was scathing. They fined Rust Movie Productions over $100,000. They were trying to find them the statutory max, and then the parties settled at that $100,000 fine. But as the prosecution pointed out on cross-examination, the role of OSHA is to determine if employers are um, maintaining an unsafe work environment. It's not to find criminal liability. It's not to find civil liability. It is specifically an administrative function to uh, sort out whether or not the workplace was unsafe and if the employer is at fault for that. And they determined here the employer was at fault for that. Will that help poke holes in whether or not Hannah was doing her job responsibly because of how badly production was responding to safety concerns? Maybe. It might raise some questions for some jurors. And then we got into the defense investigator who is a former homicide detective, former military, and he's talking about the quality of the investigation from an expert standpoint saying uh, the investigators should have done this, they should have done that. I agree with what a lot of what he had to say, including, you know, people shouldn't have been on their phones. Yeah, Baldwin shouldn't have been on his phone right after this happened. He should have been kept separate from other witnesses. So should Dave Halls. But he also was trying to poke holes in things that really aren't at issue in this case. No one is questioning whether the gun recovered from law enforcement was the gun that was in Baldwin's hand. There's been no issues about that. So to try to raise that issue this late in trial, when the defense hasn't vigorously cross-examined about that, isn't really going to get very far. And then on the beginning of cross-examination, this witness was asked, is there any controversy over whether or not the gun that shot Helena Hutchins was the gun that Baldwin had was the gun law enforcement recovered? He's like, well, no. So we'll see what the rest of cross-examination looks like. And now we've got, we get to see the defense in the role of asking those leading or asking those non-leading direct questions. We get to see the prosecution in the role of cross-examination. And we will see if the defense successfully uh, raises some doubt in the minds of some of the jurors, because ultimately that's what they need. Let's get to your question. I'm going to just resort my screens real quick because um, much like the prosecutor in this case, <laughs> I don't want to have to take my glasses on and off so I can read the chat. Every time she pulls her glasses on and off, I'm like, oh, I get it. Like, I get it. The The reason these are not the glasses you'll see me walking around in if you run into me in public um, is because these are my readers so I can read the computer screen and read the chat better. But these are not my driving glasses. Like, I understand. Like, I get it. Like, I un I get it. <laughs> I get it. Uh, Cecile said, but for me, it's still the they armed me from Baldwin. Who is they? Baldwin says it's Dave Halls and Hannah. So Hannah was his like personal armorer. Um, so let's see. Question, just Gary asked the most important question, really. EDB, how was DMB? It was great. Um, Dave in Vegas was fantastic. We had um, an incredible spot in the pit. I got to see my boys, the Dave Matthews Band. I got to see my uh, friends and, and see a group of my uh, girlfriends from high school that we haven't all been together 
um, since one of my friend's dads passed away a few years back. So we all got to be together at Dave and there was something very special about, you know, getting out under the sky and dancing along to your favorite music from college with the people who've been some of your favorite people for basically your entire life. So it was really good. I, it was good friend time. It was good Dave time. Travel was a little bit rough. I am a little bit rough. These lawyers are making my head rough. These lawyers are exhausting me. <laughs> I'm also exhausted from friend time and from Dave time, so it's fair. Uh, Migalina, 2.30 local time, so why don't we set stream for 2.45 local time? I'll do questions for 15 minutes, and then we'll um, and then we'll uh, we'll have time for Q&A, and I'll have some time for lunch and to go, like, um, find my hair dryer and my luggage. <laughs> so Dave was good. Friends were good. Timing was hard with trial, but... Seeing people in person was fun. I ended up having to drive from Las Vegas to Phoenix. So I missed like the first three songs of Dave's sets because flights had gotten grounded and delayed due to wind in Vegas. And I was worried I would not make it at all. So I was like, fuck it, let's drive. I regretted that decision somewhere in the middle, but um, by that point you're already in the middle. So I got to go see my friends. I got to see Dave. Um, and then and then my luggage got delayed. It's just travel adventures abound. But I did get to pop in on stream with y'all yesterday from the Sky Club. And then I saw um, some of the folks from the Sky Club that had been sitting near me as I boarded the plane. And I'm like, I'm sorry if I was loud. She's like, no, I was just trying to find out what you were talking about. I was like, oh, this trial. So I think we have new law nerds because they were looking at me in Sky Club as I was talking to all of y'all. And then we got to chat on the plane and they were lovely. I always... I don't want to intrude on other people's space by streaming. Funny story, and then we'll get back to questions, is when um, my friend showed up to... Uh, Terry said, wait, so DMB was in Phoenix, not Vegas. No, I saw him two nights. I wasn't going to, but I did. I saw Dave in Vegas, and then I went to Innings Fest in Phoenix because my friends were going to Innings Fest in Phoenix. No, no, the level of insanity is high. <laughs> I... Saw Dave in Vegas. I was supposed to fly from Vegas to Phoenix. Wind was wild. So I drove from Phoenix or from Vegas to Phoenix. Beautiful drive, I will say. I've never driven that way. I've always driven back to LA. Lovely drive. Um, and then got to see other friends. So two groups of friends, two Dave Matthews concerts, a very similar set list. But I had a really good time. And then I got to spend like a a brunchy girl day with my friends. We had a beautiful brunch, went and got pedicures and went to Sephora. It it was basically the perfect day for me. I had the best, had the best time. Um, and then instead of dinner, we ate snacks and appetizers. It was absolutely lovely. So I ended up driving. <laughs> Cheryl Ray, that's true. That's true. Did Dave play my song? Some songs I was very excited for, but did not play beach ball. Um, did we see 10-year-olds at Sephora? Not really. Will you do anything special when you hit the 100th DMB show? Probably. Did he play the song I was waiting for? No. Question, how many teenagers in Sephora? Not a ton of teenagers in the Sephora we went to in Scottsdale. So it was late on a Sunday afternoon, though. Maybe they had to get home for school. But I had run out of eye patches, um, and I desperately need them with all this travel. My face was puffy from hotel sleeps and uh, feather pillows. Red Mink says, I think many jurors will get it. If someone falls at work, the employee who set it down is not at fault. It is comp responsibility to make sure I'm doing a job safely. And if it's a good point, if, um, if the jurors work in workplaces where it's ultimately their supervisors or some possibility, that is a huge, huge deal. So that's why the armor expert was so important for the prosecution. And that's why I think the armor expert should have been one of the last witnesses. The ordering of this, I'm going to, I have a rant. I promise it won't be too long. The ordering, the ordering of these witnesses for the prosecution has been rough for me. The witnesses yesterday felt like a complete waste of time, except for Seth Kinney, who felt like a lot of anticipation and then like a wah, wah, like just wah. We were promised a vigorous cross of Seth Kinney that did not happen at all. The 
the witness who in big into the photos should have been dumped somewhere in the middle with all of the with all of the foundational witnesses like when they spent an entire day going over this round was recovered from here and it's evidence item number that that's where you put the photo guy just like dump him with all of the other foundational witnesses bring in the armor expert bring in um may really maybe director joel souza as the last two witnesses put you know put seth kinney and dave halls and sarah zachary and mimi mitchell and pickle and whoever put them all together put um souza and the armor expert at the end remind the jury what the armorer's job what the fuck the armorer's job is at the end especially if you know the defense is going to be bringing those osha experts early the photo guy bury somewhere else i understand look Trials like travel do not go perfectly. I understand that experts have travel. I understand that it can be very difficult to stagger your witnesses the way that you want them. But the storytelling got very lost in this trial because stuff felt so out of order. Sometimes that is a circumstance. Sometimes it is not. This is a, um, it shouldn't be a complex case, but I imagine Joel Souza would have been there um, whenever you asked him to. And I wonder if the armorer expert would have been too. So I would have liked to have seen it more that way and either play. I, I think Runkle said this last night as I was listening to him driving back from the airport, either play Hannah's videos very early in the case or play them towards the end of the case. So you're ending with her own words, but they buried that in the place where all the boring shit goes. The first day of trial needs to be riveting stuff. The last day of your case needs to be riveting stuff. The middle can be all the foundational stuff that you have to get into properly, but you'll argue in closing. Her interviews should not be slept, schlepped right into the middle of that for me. And they could have put those interviews on anytime because that uh, the, the uh, investigating officer is going to be there the entire trial anyway. So maybe we'll see different ordering of witnesses um, later. I don't know. Amanda said, scary part, if she is not responsible for the firearms she is loading and passing to other people, she has less responsibility than private gun owners who are expected to keep them safe and secure. Amanda, it's an excellent kind of policy perspective. Um, Adina said, question, are sidebar objections allowed? Shouldn't the objections ground a ruling be heard by the jury and the court reporter? Adina, yes. And the court reporter can hear the sidebars. So the sidebars will be reported on. But should the jury hear them? Yes. But... The judge ruled everything's going to sidebar because the attorneys were acting like children in the middle and bickering back and forth. Half these objections are never ruled on. This, this case is going to be an appellate freaking nightmare because the judge doesn't rule on half the objections. The lawyers just kind of chat it out themselves. It's like, oh yeah, I'll rephrase it. Oh no, I'll restate that. Oh, I caught this one. I got it. Like they're just like working on a group project together. Um, and so the judge never rules and nobody ever says the grounds. Gina said, as someone who works in workplace safety in Australia, it's really interesting to see how the laws differ and how they are applied to a case. Thanks for all your informative commentary and entertainment. Jenna, you're welcome. And yes. Shelly said, OSHA visits or findings are a big deal to an organization employee health nurse for 18 years. I prepare our annual reports. Yeah, and Rust Movie Productions left the state. The movie was not finished in New Mexico. I think there's probably a reason for that. Um, after... The nonsense in this trial, what are the chances of us watching Baldwin? Oh, Baldwin's attorneys have to be giggling. Like, it's not often you get to watch tape on other attorneys like you're preparing for a football game or baseball, sports ball, whatever game. The attorneys for Baldwin get to watch this prosecutor in action. This prosecutor leaves half her direct examination for redirect. And if I was the defense, A, I'd be shutting it down. But if I was the defense... There would be some witnesses I wouldn't do a cross of and let her stick with the evidence she didn't get into because she didn't ask it. No cross. What are you going to redirect now? She leaves so much for redirect and it can be a huge pitfall if the defense starts objecting vigorously to outside the scope of cross-examination. Um, and I I don't doubt that, I'm. I mean, I'm not the smartest lawyer in the world. I don't doubt that Baldwin's lawyers are also perceiving all of these things as they're watching, it's going to be a very, very different trial when we got to Baldwin. But there is some really good evidence in this case that will help Baldwin's case. Some of these experts are very good 
for Baldwin. Um, especially the armorer expert that says if the actor checks the gun, then the armorer has to check the gun again. And we know that there's no time on this set. And Baldwin's like, let's go, let's go, let's go. So the liability on actor is going to be different than the liability on producer for Baldwin. So we'll see. Because as an actor, they're saying no. You know, if he does check the weapon, the armorer has to recheck. And we already saw how fast this set was moving. But we're going to be chat. You guys are in such a great position, A, eh? because you're wise law nerds and you're hydrated and you have healthy boundaries and glowing skin. Um, and you can parallel park. And we love that for all of us. But Baldwin's trial is going to be so interesting because we will have already seen these witnesses. So now we get to say, okay, well, we saw the cross-examine of Seth Kinney, but we haven't seen the Baldwin lawyers cross-examination of Seth Kinney. Is it going to be different? Are people going to shift their strategies after this trial? Oh, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting. Um, Stephen EDB, I needed to get on the EDB friend wait list. Not a wait list. Not a wait list at all, unless we're talking about like Pokemon Sleep. Uh, I have some openings there. I'll put it in the member spaces. Emily, how might I get access to the video feed of an arraignment in Nashville for a guy who killed my niece? Linda, I am so sorry to hear that. Sorry, this is unrelated to Rust. Linda, it is unrelated to Rust. Um, you can shoot our team an email, but I don't know if I can help. My best suggestion would be to try to figure out what courtroom it's going to and reach out to the court clerk. You can call or email the, clerk, the court clerk um, with the case number and see if they will have access to Zoom. You can also call the DA's office victim witness assistance and ask if they will have access to that. So there are a couple people you can get in touch with. Um, you can also reach out to family if that is comfortable for you and ask if they have access. So to summarize, the DA's office that's prosecuting it, victim witness assistance, should have help with that. The court clerk can also have information, and they are there to help if you approach them asking for help. Um, if you are nice to clerk, court clerks, they will do everything they can for you. But Linda, I am sorry for your loss, and it is not an easy process to go through, especially from afar if you can't be in court and you want to be. Lacey, congratulations, and thank you. New member from Canada. Love our international members. You guys are welcome to drop your uh, drop your country flags in the chat if you are so inclined. Music to my soul. I have never been more sure that the Lawners were my people than I am now seeing all the references to the Princess Bride. <laughs> Love EDB and all. Oh, yes. We all apparently share the same brain space. Very different life experiences. Same pop culture references. I hope someone asked the OSHA why OSHA didn't interview Gabrielle Pickle, line producer, recipient of safety complaints seems like kind of a big deal. It does. And they didn't. They reviewed emails. Weird. Charles Vance says it's all they have at this point. It's a Hail Mary or for jury nullification out of sympathy. I, I think they're trying to raise doubt and we'll, we'll do a poll later to see if they did. Can unions penalize members for sucking? I don't know. Um, in the way that lawyers can be disbarred. I heard Dave Hall's is uh, FICOR, I don't know what that means, but I wonder if the DGA would have gotten involved if he were in that union. I don't know. Um, as first AD, wouldn't he be an IATSE? I don't know. I, I truly don't know, um, how they would operate. Um, I scream Sunday said all of this proves that others deserve prosecution. I don't disagree with that. Why are they leading slash allowed to lead so much incompetent style? Is this common in court? Nobody's objecting. So now it's just going unchecked. I also, um, a number of you have mentioned, I have not independently researched. Uh, Carrie Morrissey, the special prosecutor is a special prosecutor. She probably works in the defense realm more, even if she had been a prosecutor in the past. Defense attorneys cross-examine much more than they direct examine. So it becomes the it becomes the pattern of your questioning. Uh, and it's fucking easier, especially when you're tired and you're like, can we, do you remember a weird thing happening is a vague and overbroad question, right? So it's, it's hard to, um, it's hard to nail it down. So your concert travels inspired us to this year for us. <gasps> J. Michael R. And I'm so excited. Look, the live music is good for the soul. I, I truly believe live music is good for the soul. It just, it, it, it is just, it does something to the body. It it does. It is good. It makes me happy. I need to refill occasionally. 
So the fact that Dave will sometimes play a February show uh, or February, early March, and then it kind of holds me through till like the beginning of the summer tour. So that kind of balances my year. Uh, but none of this alleviates Hannah's responsibility, right? Unless it pokes doubt. Um, I seem to have walked in on something spicy. Yeah, we got into some spice a little bit. Brenda said, question, how do they know it was the same phone Alec had in New Mexico? I don't know. I don't know if they do. Uh, I don't know if they do. Fit and Curvy said, random news. I got my lawn or tumbler yesterday. It was a lovely treat after a wild day at work. I'm glad. Wedge said, I don't get the involuntary manslaughter charge. That live round was brought on the set with the intent to kill. Wedge, I don't know if they can prove intent to kill. I think it was negligence. Um, that's what live rounds are designed to do. This was planned. Wedge, I, I can see the train of thought. I just disagree. I think it was negligence. And when you get to negligence, you don't have intent to kill. I don't think they've proved that somebody had beef and brought it onto set for that reason. I think it was um, a lot of negligence. And, and for all of you in the chat talking about if he's DGA, I don't know. He might be. Um, I, I tr This is not my realm. I am not an expert in the film industry for sure. Glad to be back in our normal space with EDB. Me too. My chair is much more comfortable. Agreed if workplace and culture is unsafe, it matters. And that might be a huge part of this here. Um, are we there yet? Said Emily, do you see any strategy in order of calling witnesses from the prosecution? No. No. I, I don't. I, no, I don't. Maybe, maybe in hindsight later I will be able to. But right now I'm like, they ended on a fizzle, which is not what you want at the end of your case. They ended on a... They ended on a, a note where I imagine the jury is just like, why are we doing this today? Like yesterday was awful for them. It was just, it, there was, n there was just nothing. You, the prosecution's case ended and you're like, that's it. Okay. That's it. Uh, all right. Awful. Awful. Um, I had a student named Osha years ago. My classroom uh, was safe the whole time they were in class. Just, that's, that's very, very funny. Um, knit one law two said when I was an OSI agent, we secured everything, even in cases where it was initially identified as accidental. There are a number of valid concerns with how this investigation was done. I agree with you. There are absolutely valid concerns. Carol said, EDB, what's the lesser of the sentence Hannah could be facing? Probation. Probation is the, if she is convicted, probation is the lightest sentence. Has the prosecution rested? Yes. Yesterday. Oh, now my throat. Would movie staff really think an accident equals trial? No, they would not. No, they would not. I don't think anyone. Well, we heard that Hannah was worried about it after she found out that Helena had died. Once you find out somebody has died, you have to start, I would imagine, being concerned. This case has me asking questions still. Same. Uh, Cumulus Cloud said, I don't understand why New Mexico State Police were not called. Most states have the ability to deploy to crime scenes beyond their manpower. I don't know, and nobody has asked that question. To me, it comes down to, was Hannah Gutierrez so inebriated she couldn't perform her role? I don't believe so at this point. I don't believe she was inebriated either, but that doesn't mean she didn't do her job recklessly by not checking rounds. Um, ask Tracy L. Singh, RNJD. Emily, I'm so glad you're back home safe and on live trial with us today. Me too. I'm waiting for today to be uh, educational. I want to see good lawyering, and I want to learn some stuff. If prosecution witness order was akin to a research paper structure, the paper would get an F. Yep. Uh, thank you guys for the well wishes. Behind on life. Same. Think you need to know. I oh, This we caught up with. Thank you. Um, Gwen said, I got my tumbler yesterday. I hugged it in Australia. I'm so glad you got it. Is it really ethical for Alec Baldwin's New Mexico attorney, Heather LeBlanc, the brunette with a laptop always open to be sitting directly behind the defense table trying to eavesdrop? I don't know if that's just where she's sitting to watch the trial because if they were sitting behind the prosecution, it would seem more sus, um, but they should definitely be sitting in court. They should absolutely be sitting in court. So trying to eavesdrop, I can't ascribe um, intent to that, but they should definitely be in court. Welcome home. Happy you had a wonderful trip. Thank you. Could the defense investigator be pointing out general negligence by law enforcement on the scene to cast a doubt on the rest of their investigation? That's exactly what they're doing. Yeah, that's what they're doing. Um, doubt. They need to bring doubt. Question, why is there no objection followed with overruled sustained from this judge in this trial? The fuck if I know. Uh, it's Lauren, it's it's a great question. The appellate record is going to be a nightmare if she's convicted. And uh, I, I don't know. 
I don't know why. It's awful. I hope he was paid more than the clarified image guy. Yeah, they never asked. I just, out of curiosity, I just want to know. Uh, someone 7761 said, bottom line is no one proved other, is no one has proved other than Hannah loaded the gun, meaning she put a live round in it. She's still responsible. And at the end of the day, that's where the jury may get to too. Question, can the witness and evidence affect a sentence if guilty? Yes, Jay Ford. I think it's a little bit of a longer answer, but there's a lot of factors that go into sentencing and we see that more in big sentencing hearings like with, um, who had a pretty feisty sentencing hearing? Daryl Brooks, where you see a lot of the victim impact statements. But yeah, the egregiousness of a thing, the witness testimony about the egregiousness of a thing can absolutely factor into the judge's sentence when the judge sentences a person. Um, but on the mitigating side, the workplace environment and the stress and or um, constraints Hannah was under can also um, air in her favor like this. So it goes both ways. I was shocked when um, Seth Kinney was testifying yesterday and he was kind of talking about everything Hannah was dealing with and the defense cut him off and moved a completely different way. And I was like, no, can you let him explain to the jury everything she was facing? That seems to be your whole theory of the case. So um, can tiredness be a defense? Not here, not in this criminal case. No. Um, tiredness cannot be a defense because that would fall under criminal negligence. The OG Allison said if Hannah is convicted, can Alex attorneys use her conviction as um use her conviction and use the shaggy defense? It wasn't me. Not effectively, because the both are being charged for involuntary manslaughter, but the theories of involuntary manslaughter are different. For Baldwin, it's going to be negligent use of a firearm, pointing it at someone and pulling the trigger. And it's going to be doing your job recklessly because he was a producer and he was, by being a producer, somewhat in charge of workplace safety. So those are the different two theories uh, for Baldwin. So Baldwin, Baldwin's case and Hannah's case are unrelated in that the one doesn't affect the other. Hannah could be acquitted and Baldwin can still be tried and convicted for his own actions. So no, the one doesn't um, affect the other. Question, not a question. Just want to make sure Emily knows that Suika got an update for DLC that allows multiplayer now. I got a text about that. I haven't had a chance to play my Switch in like a month. Do Baldwin and Hannah face the same charges? Eva, yes, same charges, different theories of liability, um, but both involuntary manslaughter. This is why the judge allowed coffee, all this stuff like around to find their point. It's still not helping. EDB, can we get a few thousand law nerds to wish, pray, Will I go into labor this weekend? She'd be a fifth generation born March 8th. She loves you. Um, Heather, March 8th vibes all the way around. Friday's a good day to have a baby. AB is also guilty because he never checked the gun and pointed it at a eight at uh, Helena Hutchins per George Clooney. Unfortunately, George Clooney is not going to be an expert testifying in that trial or any of these trials, but uh, the negligent use of a firearm pointing at center mass at someone is a problem. Charles Vance said, although the armorer would normally be responsible for stopping the set for unsafe act, Rust Productions did not follow the safety bulletin number one and did not give its armorer this authority. And that is part of why the defense brought in the two OSHA experts to say, even though the armorer expert says she has this power, she was not given this power. Court needs specific objection buttons. <laughs> Hearsay. No, the lawyers have to do it on their feet. You have to do it on your feet. Question, okay, why didn't the prosecution ask if he knew that the armorer's job to shut down production in unsafe situations? I don't know. I find myself sitting here at this trial going, why are they doing that? I don't know. I try to explain this trial to Judge Abby when we chat about trial at the end of the day. And I'm like, your honor, the judge never rules on the objections. The lawyers just kind of like mumble and then they move on. Like, I don't, I don't understand what's happening. It's it's so wild. It's just so wild. So with all of that, law nerds, I think I got to everything. Um, Darcy said is Alec Baldwin's police interview. He emphasized Hannah handed him the gun and not Dave Halls. He said Hannah always handed him the gun. Dave Halls never did. Dave Halls is liable as a safety head, but Hannah loaded the gun and gave it to AB. AB's statements are not going to come in in this trial. Um, they'll come in in his trial. Phil asked, does the jury get to recommend sentencing? No, the jury does not recommend sentencing in this type of a case. 
There are different cases where that is different, but in this case, if convicted, the judge will sentence. Um, Lyndon said, be honest with us, EDB. How often do you call Judge Abby your honor? Uh, on occasion, but not always. <laughs> we talk like multiple times a day, but um, but I I only call her your honor sometimes. So with all of that, I am going to go get a little bit of lunch. You are going to go get a little bit of lunch. We'll be back here in just about an hour. This should redirect you if you want to go chat over there. I do need to remind you, if you are new here, do the YouTube things. They're very helpful. Download the Lawnard app. It's free, iOS and Android. So when like Facebook and Instagram and everything else goes down, I can still let you know when we are streaming and how we are streaming. Because today, you know what was working? YouTube and the app. So it will keep you in the loop. And I appreciate you. We have over 30,000 law nerds up, up in this app. And we have some good things coming to the app. So you don't want to miss it. If you enjoy being a law nerd. And with that, I'm going to go take a quick lunch break. I will see you after lunch. Law nerds, you're the best nerds. I'll see you in a minute. You can stay up to date with everything I'm covering and fast notifications on our free iOS and Android app at lawnerdapp.com or search the app store for Law Nerd. You can also follow me around social media. And don't forget to check out my podcast, The Emily Show, with quick bits dropping every Monday, summarizing everything I do here on the live streams on Tuesday and Thursday for when you just have time for the quick bits. Thanks for being a Law Nerd.